Um, good afternoon or good morning, everybody, dependent on ex where you are. Uh, welcome. Um, welcome definitely across the pond, which we have quite a few of our American uh, peers on the line. Uh, and we've also got the Far Eastern Europe and a couple from as far afield as Pakistan and from Dubai as well. So welcome all. Uh, this has become a regular thing. I know most of you have been on the majority of the calls that we've done. Um, I'm over the moon that we've managed to get the panel together that we've actually got today. Uh, the roundtable events have seemed to be very popular. The feedback we've got is it's been fantastic. So we thought if it's not broken, why fix it? The only addition we've got to previous ones, you'll notice in the top left corner, we've got Dr. Trevor Berry, who's actually come on the call. Uh, Trevor is a neurochiropractor out in Arizona, and he just needed an excuse to get out of the 110 degrees Fahrenheit and get into the air conditioning. <laughs> so uh, so welcome, Trevor, to this call. Good to be um, here. I'll Thanks for having me. No problem. Um, the title is Mental Health and Wellness, and we're going to be making specific reference to things like brain inflammation, brain barrier systems, neurodegeneration, neurochemistry, musculoskeletal health, brain concussion, and immune support. Uh, we have a plethora of videos and questions which we're actually going to first go through. Um, and then by all means, you guys will see down the bottom right-hand corner, you'll see a questions uh, bar. Put your questions in there, and then after we finish, we'll go through each and every one and put them to the panel. Um, I think uh, Dr. Berry may have to leave us a little bit early. So, uh, Trevor, when you are ready to leave, just stick your, your hand up and we know that you're going. I think everybody else should be okay. So, uh, just do crack on. Uh, it's a British uh, slogan there, guys. Um, I'd like to introduce you to Trevor uh, again. Uh, Trevor was actually born and raised in Canada, but he actually has his practice now out of um, Phoenix in Arizona. Um, he went to Parker University in Dallas to qualify, gradu graduated magna cum laude, um, and was the recipient of many ac academic awards, including the Parker Scholastic, probably pronounced that wrong, excellent award. He went on to become a board certified chiropractic neurologist in 2001 and has over 2,500 hours in post doctoral studies in neurology, functional medicine, and low level laser therapy. Now, you guys, I think, um, will be well aware of our other guests because you, a lot of you have actually been on before. Um, next, we've got, moving along, is Dr. Robert Silverman. Uh, Dr. Rob Silverman, he's clinical, a, a chiropractic doctor, clinical nutritionist, national international speaker. Um, as with Dr. Berry, he's been across to the UK and done a very successful um, seminar. And we can't wait to get these guys back as soon as the pandemic has actually died down. Um, Rob is very active on social media, um, and you'll find a lot of his um, his his watch shop. Are they called watch shops, Rob? Are they called watch shops that you do on Facebook? Oh, Facebook Lives uh, podcasts, yeah. Watch parties. The podcast. Watch parties. Watch parties. That's what That's you the one. That's the one. So we've also got Dr. Kirk Gare back on the call as well. So welcome, Kirk. Again. Thank you. Um, Kirk has been using code lasers since 2004, worked with Super Bowl champion players, World Series champions, Olympic gold medalists and world record holders, national and state champions, as well as weekend warriors. Uh, the techniques he has pioneered down there in California has earned him the reputation of the voodoo doctor because of how fast and effective they are. Uh, and non-injured athletes regularly come to him for sports performance, and performance enhancement. So that's a good spread, I think, of... Um, of uh, qualities we got there. Next, we've got Dr. Jake Cook. Uh, Jake's one of our own in the UK. Jake's a neurochiropractor, uh, graduated from AECC down in Bournemouth, passed the American Chiropractic Neurology Board Exams 2014, currently undertaking a master's in MSK Neuroscience, and recently opened his own clinic in Woking, which is in Surrey, which focuses on patients with chronic pain and dizziness. So welcome again, Jake. And last but not least, I see down the bottom, he's just joined Dr. Uh, Mr. Robert Sullivan. Robert is an um, orthopedic reconstructive podiatrist, uh, very much known for thinking outside the box. Uh, he has greatly expanded his scope of practice in the last 25 years. Uh, Robert's special interests are non-thermal lasers, pain management, fat cell management, immunology. And I think everybody on this screen has actually participated 
in one way or another with various um, clinical trials that have been done with the aconia lasers. So they're very well versed to actually give a good lot of opinions. So guys, welcome. Thank you. Happy to be here. What we're going to do is we, we've got like we did last time, you can probably see the screen there. Um, we've got a, a range of videos, which are questions from um, some of our laser users in Europe, but also non-laser users who are thinking of coming on board. Um, we've also got um, just some standard verbal questions that people have sent in who unfortunately couldn't make it on the call. Um, we will be welcoming a little bit later, be pleased to be welcoming Mrs. Sana Homgren, who is a couple of hours north of Stockholm, who will be joining halfway through. Um, Sana is very experienced. Uh, she's a, a, a neurotherapist, and she does a lot of good work with the lasers across there. And there's a very interesting case study that Sana was responsible for bringing to our, uh, our shores not that long ago. So we're going to play it, and if anybody has any questions to Sana, I will unmute her and bring her in on the call. So one last thing, guys, you will actually see in your, um, in your webinar panel, you'll see a little hand, which you will um, see, which is circled there. Uh, anybody has a question, just click on there and we will actually see it come up on our screen and uh, we'll try to get to your question as soon as we can. Okay, the first question is from uh, Julia Waring. She's a PL Touch owner. In the UK, for some reason, it's not. Doing one second, guys. Apologies for this. For some reason, it's not playing. Just copy and paste ah, it to the assignment and then into your browser. That'll work okay, better. Okay, we've got it going now. Great. Here's the, the question for Julia. Uh, prompt, uh, apologies about that, guys. Hello, my name is Julia Waring. I own a PL Touch Laser, uh, which I bought last November, and I have an interest in functional neurology. I have had and still do have patients who have proprioceptive problems causing numbness, loss of balance, occasional dizziness, nausea and patient distress mm -hmm. due to a number of factors such as spinal cord impingement, particularly in the neck region, cerebellar dysfunction, psychological disorders, migraine, plus of course the chiropractic nightmare, vertebrae bacilla insufficiency. Do you have a set protocol? neurological protocol to help differentiate between them and which actually are amenable to treatment using the laser uh, what protocols would you use are you able to use the laser on the brain and spinal cord at the same time like using a pl touch or are different frequencies needed for each separate region thank you okay <clears throat> That's from Julia. So we'll um, we'll get going. Trevor, would you like to um, to start uh, answering that question, please? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, yeah, obviously the neat thing about the PL Touch with the two heads is that it does uh, a lot of dual tasking at the same time. I'm sure Dr. Gare and Silverman, and the crew, um, last time talked about upregulation at a nerve root level. So. Anytime you're dealing with the peripheral nervous system, you're, um, it's always a good idea to put the one head at the spinal cord level, the nerve root, and then span the other head over the uh, you know targeted tissue. But one of the things that I always teach to is that whenever you're dealing with neurological activity, whether it's uh, a peripheral neuropathy, a pain syndrome, things like that, I always tell my doctors to make sure you swim upstream. So. Uh, once you've upregulated the peripheral tissue, one of the things I'll always do is, is work my way into the central nervous system. Um, I do a lot of parietal lobe based, you know, brain based activation as well, so that you're upregulating that activity of the, you know, somesthetic cortex and increasing the activity of that. Um, so that's something that when we do those kind of things, we'll tend to co activate as well, too. So we'll use the laser in conjunction with say our percussor on the peripheral tissue to increase, mm -hmm. uh, you know, say a vibration stimulation to get more large diameter activation or do, you know, chiropractic techniques, different things like that at the same time uh, to increase the functionality. So 
Um, it's something that you always want to try and stack your therapies. Um, it's always a good idea to have the laser going and then add whatever modalities. And I, you know, I don't care if, if you're a, more of a soft tissue practitioner, do just adjusting techniques, things like that. Anytime you can get the laser energy on the central nervous system and peripheral nervous system at the same time, that's going to help, uh, help the effectiveness of those modalities that much more. Dr. Rob Silverman. Yeah, that was, that was a great answer. And um, everything that Dr. Barry said, I, I truly agree with. I really like the stacking and I like the laser synergy with any kind of chiropractic uh, treatment. Um, real easy. I happen to have my handy dandy one here. So brain, nerve root, spinal cord, nerve root. I sometimes stack them together uh, for what Trevor referred to as uh, upregulation or upstream, which is great. Um, in addition, um, I don't get as fancy sometimes with the, with the frequency. She had asked about that. I know she has the PL touch. So it's for me, 4933.60 for my FX, it's 4949. Um, good article that I found for her was on laser and spinal cord and spinal cord injury. It really showed, this is from nature.com in April of 2014. Low level A's has the potential for reducing inflammation regulates macrophage and microglials and we all know the difference between macrophage and, and micro, um, microglials it also prov promotes uh, neuronal survival so I, I think that I know she's in neurophysiology with that PL touch I think it's a great choice for what she's doing and um, I think that she'd also asked could you do them differently so for me and I'm going to piggyback kind of on what Trevor just said also was I would separate them but it would also use them simultaneously, the heads. You know, um, one of the things that's interesting, we are chiropractors, we all have different um, philosophies and approaches, but um, I try and view all the attendees to try and put the laser actually on the spinal cord and stimulate that central nervous system. So to answer a question succinctly, you can split them, you can put the heads together, and uh, again, the frequencies, you can always use Jerome's book, which is, you know, got a cornucopia of frequencies and yeah thanks kirk and yeah. um that's a great starting point and um i i know dr barry i know dr gear and uh cook and sullivan have their little um favorites and i think that um having done so many of these everybody's asking like what's your five favorite or your three favorite uh frequencies okay thanks for that rob uh, uh jake do you want to go next Well, James, Jake seems to have lost a bit of volume there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we Maybe can't you, hear you. Yeah. No, I'll tell you what, was, you, ah, there you are. Yes. <laughs> got you back. <laughs> I'm still on for one more week. I've got daddy daycare until my son goes back to nursery. So I've, I've locked him in a cupboard and he's banging hard. So I thought I'd just turn off the volume so you can hear him. Um, <laughs> so two great answers. I love how fluid you guys are in knowing all the frequencies just off the top of your head. It's beautiful. Um, Yes, not a lot to add. What I would say is pre previous to our last meeting, the way I was doing things was using the laser to upregulate whatever nervous, you know, nervous system structures I wanted to, and then doing my therapy. So that might be um, using the laser over the cerebellum and the prior cortex, and then doing my adjustments or mobilization or percussion or whatever it would be. Um, and then after Dr. Gare said, do them at the same time, I've been experimenting with that over the last couple of weeks and it's it's better. Um, I'm, I think it's, I guess, a better outcome to try and provide the, you know, the laser and do your therapy at the same time, stacking, as, as Dr. Barry said. So I think that is a better way to go than the way I was doing it. Um, so that's the, the from my personal experience. But everything else sounded great. Brilliant. Kirk? Yeah, so uh, the, only, the only thing I really have to add here is I do like, out of uh, Ruruka's book, I use his neuropathy frequency on the area of involvement. So I'll use like the 4, 9, 33, and 60 on the on the brain or on the central or on the spinal cord. And as, as her question was, can the lasers be used in the brain? Absolutely. They're the only ones that are FDA cleared for a full body use, including transcranially. So that's a significant achievement that Arconia has that no other laser does. Um, I use, so the frequency I'll use on the area of involvement or the neuropathy is 4, 7, 28, 8, 33, and 2720. That's what I'll do. And just like Dr. Barry and Dr. Cook said, I love to stack therapy. So in addition to using the percussor, um, I'll also see what they can tolerate stimulation-wise. Sometimes I'll use like a cotton swab, 
if they're really, really sensitive to try to get those neurons to fire, or I might use, you know, the sharp and dull or a pinwheel, things you would normally use as a diagnostic or evaluation technique. I use them as a therapeutic technique as well. And then I like to get them to do some movement also, because I've had some complex patients come in with say like phantom limb syndrome or things of that nature. And so we'll do some different uh, movements where it doesn't aggravate their, their, uh, their problem or mirror box. I know Dr. Barry does mirror box things as well too. So we'll stack whatever we can do to try to dampen that and calm it down and even do some uh, muscle activation. And when she's asking about different things you can use it for, even with uh, chemotherapy induced peripheral neuropathy, there was a great uh, paper published in the journal Cancer, I believe in 2018, that said that laser is so effective for uh, uh, neuropathy that's induced by chemotherapy that they recommended it should be part of standard uh, medical care, not even just something that's you know uh, alternative, but it should be part of the standard protocols because it is so effective with peripheral neuropathies. So that's my two cents. Brilliant. Thanks, Kurt. Uh, Dr. Rob Sullivan? I suppose my approach, I, I'm the non-chiropractor of the bunch, so um, I don't have half the knowledge that these guys have. So when I get something that is either spinal cord based or brain based, I always kind of think what's really going on here. The body is in a state of confusion and because the body is in a state of confusion, it's not really sure what's going on and how things work. And I was quite um, intrigued to hear that the frequencies that the guys use are 4, 9, 33 and 60 because that's what I used. And I have checked back and referenced that and it actually is one that is recommended for confusion so um, my whole thing with lasers and injuries like this or conditions like this is this is electromagnetic energy transfer just get the laser on get it as close as you can to the brain get it on the spinal cord get it to where the problem is let the energy get in there the body will pretty much do the rest and my my three things with that is movement area of involvement and some sort of stimulation. So I'm not really adding anything to what the other guys had to say, so I'm going to shut up now. <laughs> Great, thanks for that, Rob. Okay, we're moving on to the next question, which is uh, also from uh, Julia. Hello, Julia Waring again. Um, I'm just wondering if you're able to suggest a list of research papers regarding effectiveness of the acurnia laser on cerebellar disorders and things like psychological disorders. Um, I've just asked this because I was wondering if they were, had been included in the dynamic chiropractic webinar uh, discovered the most research and validated modality of modern times by Dr. Gare, yeah, because uh, apparently it's not now available. Thank you. <laughs> Did everybody get that? Okay, Trevor, do you want to um, do you want to start us off on that, please? Um, I'll tell you what I'll do if you want. I've I've got literally hundreds of reference papers. I can send those to Julia, and rather than you know boring the tears out of everyone, I'll be happy to to get that to her as far as you know directly from say treatment of depression, for example, to anxiety disorders. To yeah, there's there's plenty of reference papers out there, so. Um, I don't know if you guys probably it's not the the best use of the time for me to go through all of them, but yeah, I'm, and I know Dr. Silverman, Dr. Cook, Dr. Garrett, Dr. So everyone has their their tons of reference papers. I don't think any right. of us put any slides up that aren't referenced, so we'll be happy right. to get those to her. Okay, I made, I made a note of that, Trevor. So we'll we'll definitely follow up on that with uh, Julia, uh, Rob Silverman. Anything to add? Yeah, uh, with, with Trevor covering that with the literature, a couple of quick everyday things as practitioners, uh, I always like to help along, you know, like you guys said, stack. So I'm going to stack some lifestyle changes, obviously, including free, very free, decreased sugar, all very deleterious to all the barriers, that being the gut barrier, the blood brain barrier. Of note for cerebellar, a good quality vitamin E, which um, has shown to be very effective tocotroconols, really the choice. There's eight different types of vitamin E. There's a big argument. So right now it seems that a nano vitamin E has come to the forefront. So when I heard that question, I, I knew you guys were all going to take care of the um, functional neurology very po positively. I just wanted to add the lifestyle and everyday things. Let's not forget that the beauty of the laser is not just that it's a, very, a standalone, and, and Kirk always likes to say 18 FDA clearances, but it's also very synergistic with all the other type of treatment modalities that we have at our access. Yeah. 
And okay, one other thing, okay. Simon, uh, just real okay. quick, you know, especially uh, in your neck of the woods, one of the other big depletion factors for cerebellar stuff is when you drink a lot of alcohol, that really takes out vitamin B1, thiamine. So make sure you add that to your mix as well, too, for your nutrition. Yeah, that's great advice. Jake? <laughs> Yeah, following up with the alcohol thing, I'm always amazed uh, how badly I am at detecting alcoholics. <laughs> Those guys come in and will swear they've never had a drink, and then it's only when you get them stripped down, you see that they've got like a, a polyneuropathy in their legs, and they've got no muscle below the knee. And but it's, yeah, they, they get me every time, and that, that's got to be a huge impact on on the cerebellum each time. Um, I think Dr. Barry's, yeah, the research, we discussed this last time, I think, uh, with Dr. Gare. I find the research incredibly frustrating when it comes to looking at low-level laser because so much of it is is not uh, non-thermal. It's, it's up at the way high ranges. Um, and so actually looking at Aconia studies often is the better way to go because otherwise you're just filtering through paper after paper after paper that is on a thermal laser, um, you know, up at the 780 plus uh, wavelengths. Um, if we're looking at other things for the cerebellum, the other thing I, I always want to do alongside it is breathing. Um, along with the basal ganglia, the cerebellum is, is one of the most aerobic areas in the brain. It's using huge amounts of oxygen to do all the stuff it does because it's got like half your neurons. Um, so when I'm doing therapy there, if I'm not getting them to do something clever, let's say it is my alcoholic and he's not able to coordinate body parts and stuff like that, we'll just do breathing exercises to try and get the cerebellum as much juice as it can uh, so they can optimize. Great, thanks, Jake. Kirk? Yeah, I think, uh, like everybody said, there's so much research out there, it can be overwhelming. Uh, there was one cool um, study that I'd like to mention here, since Dr. Silverman was talking about the, the gut, and we're thinking about the gut-brain access, there was a study in 2018 in Frontiers of Psychiatry that talked about the use of a low-level laser to actually enhance the microbiome and to improve the bidirectional uh, communication pathway um, in the gut-brain axis, and talked about that's role with helping with indirectly with psychiatric disorders. So she she mentioned something about depression in there, and so there's even studies that that talk about that, and especially with the way, as Dr. Silverman said, the synergistic kind of effect on the whole body, and and not ignoring the gut and its impact on the on the brain. Uh, there's studies that do show the laser helping in all these areas. Yeah, that's a good point, Rob Sullivan. Um, I I think Trevor pretty much covered that with with the research i put together a list of research papers here um like trevor said we all have our favorites i put together a list of of my favorites so i i'll just send that out to julia i don't have anything to add to anything else at the moment oh, that's great thanks that rob okay this next question is from uh, sarah Steele. Uh, sarah is a phd research scientist um, she's based in the Manchester area and somebody that we've actually had a lot of discussions with recently. And there's a couple of um, uh, longish questions here, but so um, stick with it, guys, please. Hi, my name is Sarah Steele and I'm a PhD researcher specialising in neuroscience and brain performance. And I'm going to be bringing on a red and violet laser, hopefully in the next month, as part of one of my businesses. My main question is regarding Alzheimer's disease. So with the research that I'm doing, I'm looking at Alzheimer's disease within the type 3 diabetes paradigm. So whether it could be possible that Alzheimer's disease is actually a glucose dysregulation or a cellular energy problem which therefore with the right approach through diet, but also utilizing technologies like low level laser, you may be able to start facilitating better neuronal energy and then therefore hopefully start to bring back or improve cognitive function in Alzheimer's, mild cognitive decline and mild cognitive impairment. I'm wondering if anybody has looked into the glucose side of stuff or could talk a little bit about how the laser would best be used to bring energy back into the cells um, and I'll be conducting research in the next couple of years using the laser specifically for those applications. Great, thanks for that uh, Sarah. Did you get, did you catch that okay Trevor? Yep, got it. 
All right, Fatal. here we go. This is a great question, and it, it really does uh, bring up, it illustrates all of the finer points of low-level laser therapy. Uh, neurodegeneration is really a, a, a multi-layered uh, situation with Alzheimer's-like dementia and the related uh, concomitants in that that amyloid plaque buildup or that senile plaque is, is definitely part of the pathophysiology. Um, and without a doubt, the, what the research is showing is that there is a glucose metabolism issue with that. As a matter of fact, there's a paper that just came out is they're actually having lab biomarkers or protein markers that they're seeing in the CSF of Alzheimer's patients. So yes, you need to use that laser energy to um, improve the GLUT4 receptor activity, the glucose utilization. Um, it helps with the microglial priming or inflammation of the, of the microglial system to help with that MIF factor to help the, those glial cells kind of take out the garbage, if you will. Um, it helps with the substrate. One of the big, the big things that, that we're actually turning our attention to is getting a little bit away from the amyloid only theory and getting more into the neurofibrillary tangle um, component of neurodegeneration. And what happens when you have um, excess calcium influx, for example, you can start to kick off faulty proteins. Or we're also seeing a molecule that's overtaking the L-serine amino acid. Um, it's called BMAA. And what it does is that causes protein misfolds. And when those proteins misfold, those building blocks of the neurons come crumbling down and that neuron basically withers away and dies. And so that kind of sets the table for how low level laser therapy comes in and it actually brings the energy in for say the, um, the AMPA receptor, that sodium and potassium pump, because that's mitochondrial driven. And that helps keep the proper balance or regulation of the sodium levels. And therefore um, it decreases the, the um, excess calcium influx that would set the table for those protein misfolds. Um, the other big thing with, with that is that there, we're also seeing in neurodegeneration are pathogens getting in the brain. You know, with these leaky barrier systems that Dr. Gare and Dr. Silverman went out started to talk about is that um, leaky blood brain barrier predicated by leaky gut activity um, is also one of the big things we're seeing Epstein-Barr and cytomegalovirus and different things like that that are getting into the brain. And that's actually um, kind of forcing the brain to trap those, those bugs with a micro, uh, like the amyloid beta precursor protein that makes that planking. It's like a jail cell for those pathogens. So one of the other areas is that we know in, in the, the, the literature showing that low level laser therapy can have a very powerful antimicrobial effect as well. So, and on top of everything else, it helps prevent apoptosis and that spreading effect of, of neuro, you know, when the, when neurons kind of explode, if you will, or die off, they release um, you know, glutamate and proteolytic enzymes into the surrounding tissue, and that starts to wipe out adjacent neurons as well, too. That excess glutamate in the system, that needs that sodium potassium pump to kind of get the water off the boat, if you will, and lasers do a very good job of, of doing that as well, too. So low-level laser, not just from a glucose and a dysglycemia element, but every other angle that you need um, for the brain protective mechanisms, low-level laser comes in and checks off every single box. The only caveat with low-level laser is that there's a definitive hormetic curve, and I'm sure the boys talked about it last time, is that there's a sweet spot to the brain, and ideally that's about five joules per centimeter squared or less for brain tissue. Uh, the more metabolically active a tissue, the less energy that it needs. And so one of the big misconceptions is that um, if low-level laser is good, higher-powered lasers must be better for the brain, and that can't be further from the truth. And one of the reasons I hung my hat on the Ariconia horse and no other laser company is my daughters have a severe genetic predilection from my ex-wife's side of the family. And so I, I, I read about 1,300 papers on low-level laser therapy, and every single one of them, when it came to the brain, showed that um, there's a certain sweet spot that you can't go over. And so that's why I actually signed up with Ariconia, and I, I, I only will use Ariconia products on the brains of, of not just my family members, but my patients as well. Yeah, thanks, Trevor. Actually, Trevor, I love the story you, you actually told when you came across to do your London seminar where you said, you know, people ask you quite frequently why you actually got involved with the lasers. Why did you buy them? You know, was it to, you know, enhance your practice with your patients? Well, yes. Was it to, um, you know, help the revenues into the clinic? Well, yes, that's a byproduct. But the main reason was actually to treat your own family. Yeah, the, you know, there's a saying in the profession, you don't buy laser for your patients, you buy it for yourself and your, and your family members and your patients just get to be the benefactors of your device. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Rob Silverman, thanks Trevor. 
write great dissertation, outstanding information. I take, took a ton of notes. John Hopkins, uh, 2018, had a great study. I'll share it with everybody. Simon, evidence for brain glucose dysregulation in Alzheimer's disease. Uh, also evidence, uh, another article in 2018, March, evidence for brain glucose dysregulation in Alzheimer's disease. Uh, Trevor's doing a great job of talking about the excitotoxicity. One of the great uh, benefits, once again, is to close that uh, synaptic cleft, that NMADR cleft. Taurine also helps with that. Um, really to piggyback on what he said, you don't want a high power laser because it just, it generates heat. We don't want to generate heat. We want to generate mitochondrial activity. There's a ton of articles that the panel can share with everybody on that. Uh, in reference to Sarah's question, I was writing down like my answer when a doctor came in yesterday and he was a medical doctor who really wanted to know how uh, the laser worked on energy. So I wrote, uh, Laser, laser stimulates endogenous substances such as flavins and cytochromes, which are part of the cell's respiration. The um, absorbed energy is converted to free oxygen, which stimulates respiration, increases ATP production in the mitochondria. So it does work at both levels. Uh, interestingly enough, really, I, I'm, a, I'm a gut to brain axis guy. Uh, obviously, it's bidirectional brain. Whatever you do to your gut, you do to your brain. Whatever you do to your brain, you do to your gut. So, um, in reference to blood sugar, so when you look at sugar being ingested, especially a large amount, we now know that sugar doesn't initially go to the liver, it goes to the gut unless we have a large amount and then it gets funneled through uh, facilitated transport to the liver. Sugar is really uh, detrimental to gut health. It actually in many instances will increase the release of what we call LPS. LPS stimulates something called toll-like receptors. This can release amyloid from the gut going through that broken barrier that uh, Trevor was talking about, gut barrier leading to a damaged blood-brain barrier. And I think at some point we should all talk about the blood-brain barrier, you know, that single layer epithelial cell that's got the thickness of a wet paper towel that protects our brain, even though it filters 400 miles of arteries. Um, that ingestion of sugar, that dysregulation damages those barriers and the laser is able to ameliorate that at multiple levels because I use the laser on the gut and we've found that there are studies that show that it takes the gut from being anaerobic where the bad bacteria love to live into an aerobic status where the bad bacteria don't like it because we want to be an inhospitable host for what we call all these pathogens. So her question was right on. And um, again, I always like to give that little um, lateral view to bring it to the centerpiece for the synergistic uh, opportunity that laser can bring to all the different uh, pathways in that bi-directional pathway. Yeah, two fantastic explanations there. Uh, Jake, anything to add? Yeah, that was Fantastic answers. Um, I'm actually going to put it back to to, to um, Trevor, if that's okay. So for her research, she wants to know. She wants to, obviously wants to use lasers to look at the research. Um, obviously, when we think Alzheimer's, we're thinking possibly, you know, classically starting temporal, but it doesn't have to be just located in that one area. How would you advise, or how what how would you go about using a protocol? Do you do you go over temporal areas more, or do you do you just hit the whole thing, or where would you where would you start? That's a great question. Um, so a couple of things, actually, this would be a good opportunity also to bring up frequency specific stuff too, because I'm all for four, nine, 30, 360. That's, you know, that's standard for brain uh, protocols and things like that. But uh, this is a great time to interject that 40 Hertz has a very, very powerful activation of the long-term potentiation in that CA1 region of the hippocampus that Dr. Cook is referencing. Dementia starts in the hippocampus and kind of works its way up and over in later stages. And we've seen in multiple types of studies, like in binaural studies, in uh, visually evoked potential studies, things like that, that 40 hertz is very good for um, uh, getting rid of amyloid placking, for increasing long-term potentiation, new pathway formation, things like that. So we use 40 hertz as one of our base frequencies. The other one that we use on all of our brain-based patients is the vagus nerve that Dr. Silverman does a great job of talking about. And, and we all, I think, speak to the brain-gut axis in that bi-directional highway. The vagus nerve loves 10 hertz frequencies. So we love to use 10 hertz as one of our basic ones. And, and another big one we love is a one hertz frequency. One hertz does a great job of interhemispheric communication. So the brain's ability to communicate, this is big on say autism cases and things like that, where you get too much lateralization of function. 
So the ability for your neurons and the different parts of the brain to work together is, is really well driven by one hertz frequency. So my base default brain setting for neural rehab, anything of neck on up is one, 10, 40, and 60. And that, that works, we find clinically, that works even better than the 493360. Now, Dr. Cook, to your point, what I like to do with my FX, I'm, I'm just going to try and pull it over my head here, is we like to do what I call, you know, the Mohawk type setting. So we'll do one in the, in the frontal prefrontal region here. We drop it right down the apex, right on the midline there to help with that midline stimulation, and then one at the base of the skull. That's my favorite thing. We'll do a 10 hertz uh, or a 10 minute treatment with that. And then we may coactivate at the same time, but that's my most fundamental thing I'll do with the FX. Now, obviously with the PL touch, you know, we can get into some like cross cerebellar frontal activity um, where you put the one diode. So we know that in the, neuro, in the field of functional neurology, the right cerebellum heavily drives the left frontal lobe and vice versa. So when we're doing our PL touch, we'll do here and here for a couple of minutes. And then we'll switch and do here and here for a couple of minutes. And then we'll do apical vagal for a couple of minutes. So that's kind of like a base protocol. Obviously with the handheld, you can wand it or you can do the stands as well too. Another big thing with the one hertz, it's, it's got a very good gabinergic effect to it. Um, I think uh, uh, Steel has a question on there about um, uh, spasticity what I'll, that I'll get into in just a second. We're getting some feedback here. Um, so I'll, I'll save that for her next question, but the gabinergic stuff is big on this. So uh, 110, 40, and 60, and definitely you can go, I, and Dr. Cook, yes, we'll do if we're doing straight up memory recall stuff like those senior moments. We'll do more of a coronal setting with it on the bitemporal region. And when we may coactivate with, say, sense of smell and auditory therapies as well, too, to summate that temporal lobe as well. That's fantastic. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Trevor. Trevor. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, great. And also from your perspective as well, because Trevor, he's got the FX635 there, which one of the, the gentlemen on this uh, on the panel, on the um, attendees today, uh, Max Atkinson, has just got an FX635. He's also got an EVRL. Jake's got an EVRL, which is the red violet light. So it's always interesting to see what you would do different with either laser, whichever one you've got is going to work well. Um, and we're putting together a chart at the minute, which is, is going through uh, each laser and which laser is right for you. Jake, do you want to add anything else to that? Or should we head across to Rob Sullivan? No, I, that was so helpful. That was a really, a really great answer. Um, I suppose from my own point, I don't see a huge amount of Alzheimer's and that's why that was so, so interesting for me. Uh, but I do have quite a few cognitive decline patients. And one thing I notice a lot is that when they get stressed, uh, their symptoms get a lot worse. Uh, and we think what seems to happen is as, mid, as amygdala activity gets higher and higher, it becomes more and more toxic to the hippocampus. So as they get in a stressful situation, that amygdala activity goes up. Um, it literally shuts down the hippocampus and, and the longer you depress the hippocampus, the harder it is for it to come recover. Um, so a lot of what I'll be doing is, is obviously trying to go through stress management and stuff like that, but using the laser to try and calm down that amygdala activity um, and then trying to get them to do brain training exercises and stuff like that. Um, this yeah, was based, was as you guys, your own family, my, uh, my mother, my grandmother-in-law, um, old couples bicker and we just started noticing that when her husband was getting angry with her her brain would just shut down you know burnt cookies in the oven lost keys and stuff like that um and that's how i made the association did all the research and then found that, that that's the way to go forward with her and it's been really helpful yeah and one of the worst things that wax the hippocampus is cortisol you know and that's you know that stress response that's your body's attempt in simple terms to go find fuel to for your brain to work so um, as we're dumping cortisol, if we're in an excess stress, poor sleep patterns, things like that, cortisol is a major player. And so to that point, not just on the brain based stuff, but and I know the guys can talk to this really well, they, you know, doing visceral based stuff like adrenal uh, upregulation and liver stuff. And, you know, so you use it on a visceral level as well, too. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. Um, welcome back, Kirk. I think you've had a few, you. few issues with connection, but you're back on now. Can you hear us OK? Yeah, I can hear you guys fine. Yeah, Windows decided to update right in the middle of this thing and without giving me a warning. So <laughs> it's just 
perfect timing. Uh, yeah, so I missed a bit there. So hopefully when I answer, I'm not redundant with anything, but I got a couple of brief things to, to add in there since you, since you brought up things with blood sugar uh, and, and its impact on there. So yes, I have seen things with my patients with, uh, um, with using the laser and seeing changes in blood sugar. Um, I, I have a specific one that I shared in my seminars and also on my Facebook group page about Mondo, who we use the Zorona on him. And in one month, just doing four sessions, uh, lasering over the abdomen near the pancreas as well too, of course, is that his A1C went from 10.7 to seven and his fasting glucose went from 305 to, I believe it was like 120 within a month. That was such a startling drop that her, his MD even asked, what are you doing because diet and medications do not cause that fast of a change uh, in, in that. And she actually recommended him to continue with the laser because of how big those changes were in his glucose so quickly. We've replicated that a lot of times. So what I do with these, I have diabetic patients that come in is I simply will take the FX and put it around the pancreas. Well, I'll use, since she's got the EVRL, I'll put the EVRL over the pancreas for about five minutes, just on some basic frequencies on there. And we've seen some amazing changes there in these patients. The one caveat is if they're on meds, I always warn them, be sure you're checking your blood sugar regularly because this may start to control and drop significantly enough that you may need to talk to your doctor soon about changing your your dosages. Um, I even did this with my cat, Poopsie. Anyway, he was a Maine Coon kitty who got diabetes and I used my laser on him on a regular basis. And we got him from needing four units of insulin twice a day to where eventually he needed three quarters of a unit once a day, sometimes once every other day. So I do see profound changes in blood sugar. Obviously it's not a treatment for, di for diabetes. It's not cleared for that, but that's a nice uh, change that we see. And specific with his pancreas on the ultrasound by the, the veterinary doctor, um, his pancreas went from 90% destruction to 80% um, of it regenerated. It was 90% of normal within a week's time with utilizing the laser, which of course blew away the veterinary doctor. Next thing you know, they bought lasers and had signs up all over for laser therapy at his veterinary clinic. So I love using that in these cases too with the brain if a patient has diabetes. Uh, I love the fact that the EVRL has that antimicrobial effect so we know we can affect, uh, effectively help prevent those bugs from crawling up the vagus nerve and creating inflammation in the brain. So hopefully I wasn't redundant with what was said while I was blacked out there for a while. So I throw in the, the non-podiatry bit again. Um, I, I always think of um, beta amyloid plaques clumping around brain cells, kind of like adolescents clumping around campfires. And it, it's kind of a bit like that because a lot of what happens with Alzheimer's, if we, if we look at the new research, I found an interesting paper there that came out in 2019 in the medical press. And the, the suggestion there is, and I think we'd all agree with it, is that diet plays a huge role in this. And if we think in terms of diabetes, what does diabetes do? Because of the high sugar concentrations in the blood, we literally wreck nerves. What's the brain? A big nerve, you know? So it, it stands to reason. And I think really what we need to think of is the earlier we can um, reduce the event of the buildup of these amyloid plaques, the, the beta amyloid plaques, the better. So I think really from a laser point of view, um, and from a dietary management point of view, it's a case of getting people to look at their lifestyle around this earlier, rather than having to sort of fight symptoms later on down the line. So I, I kind of think with this, it's more prevention. So I tend to talk to my younger patients about this quite a bit. But in terms of the treatment of it itself, I wouldn't particularly do anything different to what's been said. Uh, what I do always do with Alzheimer's patients is we look at their blood sugar levels at the time when they're coming in. And sometimes if they're coming in and they're quite lucid, um, you're going to find the readings, the blood sugar readings are very, very different there. And as well as that, you know, you'll find a lot of protein issues as well, even in, in urine testing, because they'll get shedding, which is something that we don't really look at. But there's a lot of things going on there that we, we can actually work with. So I don't have anything to add other than that's a very interesting paper, and I'll get the references out for that to you shortly. Yeah, that's great, Rob. Thanks very much for that, guys. I have very good so, I mean, one, one other clinical nugget, if I can just add on right in the end good. here, is that um, you know one of, one of the biggest predisposing factors as part of that whole epigenetic aspect, like getting away from the whole TREM2 and APOE4 and all that, the, the number one thing that's your epigenetic tripwire, so say your APOE4, which means you're a higher, uh, you know, 
predilection for Alzheimer's is that the number one uh, tripwire is inflammation. If you look at Tansy's work out of Harvard, things like that. Well, when the brain's inflamed, what better way to decrease inflammation but low-level laser? It'll mitigate NFKB and every other cascade, the interleukin-6 and all the other inflammation chemical, uh, in, you know, inflammation factors that are related to the brain or the body for that matter. But also one of the big things that the physicians need to look at is blood flow to the brain. The number one thing I'll look for on my labs with when I take on Alzheimer's is are they anemic? Are they, are their blood pressure, is it hypo or hypertensive, things like that. And obviously lasers can help with blood perfusion. I mean, that's, that's one of its best things, increasing blood flow to the brain uh, and that kind of thing. And so you use that to support in if, whether it's a, a, you know, microcytic hypochromic anemia or megaloblastic, or, you know, that's when, you know, Dr. Silverman will talk to all the different nutrition things that we do for those, those, you know, those metabolic types of cascades. But anemia is the number one thing we look for from a, a lab perspective. And then we look at dysglycemia and then we keep, keep going on down the line. Great, thanks for that, Trevor. Um, anybody, anything else to add, or should I move on to the next one? You know what, Cy, that, you know, Trevor brought up a good point about the APOE, you know, APO4 is the predilection, but what's most interesting about that, you know, we're talking about COVID-19, now they're saying that you have a higher incidence of COVID-19 if you've got the APOE4 to speak exactly what he said, and it's what we do. We want to manage and modulate inflammation. And Piggyback in what he said, there's nothing better to create a microenvironment in the brain of decreasing inflammation than low-level laser. Yeah, I agree completely. It's, it's great having the, the, the five different perspectives because, you know, all of you are pretty much on the same page in a lot of things. But like with anything, everybody has their own little idiosyncrasies that they tailor for themselves into their practice. So this is, uh, this is great stuff. I think for me, something that suddenly sprung to mind, and I don't even know why, but there's something back here, probably my Alzheimer's is working. Suddenly I'm, I'm hearing uh, Jack Kinase inhibition and all sorts of things like this going on. So that's coming back, I think, to Trevor's inflammation. Um, but um, there's a lot to be said really for what the, the guys are saying in terms of reducing inflammation, because I mean, 99, 100% of the time, what kills us? Inflammation. Yeah, definitely. I agree completely. I'm going to be selfish again and ask another question because we've got Robert uh, here. Robert, we know with Parkinson's that we'll often do like a um, uh, fasting and things like that to try and encourage the brain to beat up some of those those uh, those naughty twisted proteins. Uh, is there any evidence that shows that that we can have the same effect for Alzheimer's? That uh, encouraging, you know, doing a period of fasting helps to eat up some of those those bad guys. You got two Roberts. I'm assuming we'll both answer it. So what you were talking about is probably like an intermittent fasting, So, which is wrong in the vernacular. Intermittent fasting refers to the idea of fasting for 24 hours. Most people are doing what we call time-restrictive eating. So we restrict our window, say 16 hours that we don't eat in eight hours, which we do eat. The whole premise, there's a multiple premise, but the big thing is what we call our autophagy. It's the body's ability of self-devouring, eating our own cells, using that energy to make new cells. Lots of literature indicate that when you have autophagy, it's immunorejuvenation. Now, they haven't done it unless Trevor or Kirk wants to speak to the idea about rejuvenating cells in the brain with autophagy. I haven't seen that yet. Um, again, it started in 2016. And Parkinson's, as you said, I'm sure will light the whole panel up, I see Trevor like ready to go and Kirk getting excited and Rob and everything like that. Um, Parkinson's and many of these neurodegenerative diseases, there is a gut component. There was an article that just came out a couple of months ago that talked about Parkinson's uh, being 50% in the gut. Um, I had a guy come in yesterday with Parkinson's, somebody that's my age. So when you see somebody shaking like this, my age, you go, I hate to say this, thank God it's not me. And I asked him, I said, are you eating gluten and dairy? J just a simple thing, are you getting any laser? And his answer was no, nobody told me that. And, you know, sort of like a couple of bricks hitting me in the head from a roof. So um, I hope I answered your question about intermittent fasting, and I hope I set the table for everybody else. Like I said, I was a point guard, so I set him up. <laughs> Rob, Rob, do you want to, other Rob, do you want to, because I, um, I do have something I want to add, Dr. Cook, on that as well, but. Like I, I would be, I would be a big proponent of that, and I, I think really the health benefits of that are well documented. Uh, and you know, I, I don't really have anything to say other than the fact that 
I think if we look at diet, if we look at nutrition, if we look at the way we eat um, and, and sort of work on that, we can change a lot of our health issues very, very, very quickly. Uh, because I think you look at through this pandemic, um, we're all heading back to work now. And there is literally a crap load of people crawling out of the woodwork with all sorts of conditions that have been basically brought on by being isolated, restricted, locked down. And, you know, they've been eating all this crap and, you know, happy days for us in terms of what we can do with that. So I think really, you know, the whole thing of restrictive eating, intermittent fasting, whatever you want to call it, is good. I did do... Um, a couple of case studies on intermittent fasting. I know the other Rob doesn't like that term, but that's what I'm using for the moment. But I did do some um, case studies on this intermittent fasting with some patients with Alzheimer's and um, it was difficult to do, their care has actually said, but it did actually make a huge difference with laser. The way we were doing the laser was basically one, one session we would do Mohawk, the other session we would do uh, Coronal. And I was using the settings there that Trevor said, because when I was over with Trevor, you gave me those settings and they're what we've been using. When we coupled that to fasting, um, we did get quite interesting changes that we weren't otherwise getting. No research to back it up. We're waiting on that. Trevor. Um, one last thing, too, on that. I think this entire panel is pretty big on doing the, you know, the, the timed eating where maybe the 16A rule where we eat eight hours of the day but don't eat 16 mm -hmm. hours of the day. I typically will do a one-day water fast about once every, say, two to three weeks. Um, a really good number to try and target for fasting is three days because it really helps reset the whole, like, the the, uh, you know, with your gut, the immune system, the, the endothelial cells of your gut lining, um, you know, that's an epithelial derivative that, that those cells can turn over. And if you can give it a three day window to do that, that's a really good thing to work up to. But Dr. Cook, going back to your question, when I take on, and I'm, I'm even hesitant to take on uh, stage six and stage seven, those late, late, late stage Alzheimer's, those patients do not do well with fasting. They, that you can actually crash their system. So I, I'll take it up to maybe about a stage four, maybe stage five Alzheimer's. But after that, I maybe do some caloric restriction with them, but I don't ever drive them into full fasting mode. Interesting. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. okay, guys, we'll, we'll move on to the next one. It's another question again from Sarah. My second question is regarding neurodivergent brains and the use of low-level laser. So I was diagnosed with ADHD last year, um, and since then I've been a massive advocate for neurotherapies and diet and other practices to help people with ADHD and autism perform better, get the most out of their brains. Um, and following a car accident in December, which is where I first was introduced to low-level laser, I became very aware of the potential benefits for brain function and brain health, um, particularly in neurodivergent populations, but also with regards to traumatic brain injury or neuroinflammation. I'm wondering if any of you have looked into or have any experience with using the laser specifically with those populations. Um, I feel as though there's a tremendous scope for bringing low level laser especially with children due to the obvious lack of side effects to help bring energy into the brain, help with neuroinflammation, help with modulating neuroendocrine hormones, anything sort of to do with getting the best out of the brain and putting the brain into the best possible state so that things like cognitive therapies and appropriate education and support can then be laid on top of that. But I'm very much an advocate for working at cell level because I do think, particularly with ADHD, that it's a, mostly a biochemical, um, it's a biochemical situation that brings out cognitive deficits or what is sort of mistermed as cognitive deficits, which actually just that child or that person needs more support than a neurotypical person. So I'd be interested to hear if you have any experience as especially through my own experience, I found that clinical research tends to be somewhat lacking um, in actually how to apply these things. And obviously it's very new. So 
would be really interesting to hear your take on those. It's a great question, Sarah. Trevor, do you want to start us off? Sure. Yeah. So I I I, I don't know if Sarah's aware we actually have a an autism study submitted to the FDA. And uh, on it was a quadruple blind. Not only did we we look at the control and treatment group, but the, Steve Shanks would not submit a study to the FDA if it didn't do uh, you know really well. So we're just waiting for the FDA. Um, you know they're they're a little bit behind right now on their processing of these things. But then we did the one year crossover where we took the control group and cre and treated them as well. And that was just using base red laser protocols with them, and it did really well on that. So watch for that to come down the pipeline, and hopefully it's coming out soon. With that said, with the, the ADHD stuff, you know, we're getting I, I, everyone, like Dr. Silverman had mentioned, obviously most of those people need to be aware of like your food eliminations and your omega-3 fatty acid ratios and different, you know, things from the nutrition side of things. Brain gut access is critical here, but just moving up, that's a very much a dopaminergic norepinephrine based activity that um, we, we need to work with. So what we do with those cases, actually that's a situation where I'll, when I'm working with the kids, I'll do different things like, um, overlap saccades and interactive metronome and different things like that while I'm lasering. I'm going right after more midbrain basal ganglionic stuff. So you may see me do frontal and nasal types of laser exposure while I'm working with those kids um, to, to kind of increase a little bit more focal up, up activity. And then what I do is I finish those patients with that, uh, again, a nice um, interconnectivity type of, of thing there. Because with the spectrum kids, a lot of times you'll see they do really poorly in right prefrontal activation and poor right mirror neuron activity and things like that. So you'll see me even bias my finish of my lasers with like left cerebellar right frontal activity. I may bring in that when I'm finishing with them, that nice one hertz again for um, you know, for the hyperactivity stuff, for calming them down. Again, that vagal stim is really good for resting, digesting as well. So you may, you know, that's another good thing, that 110 frequency. Um, and then do more of a right frontal bias while you, while you do your neurological therapies with them. Thanks, Trevor. Rob Silverman? So with the ADHD, it's interesting, the branches, and, and I'm a big vagus nerve guy, as uh, Dr. Barry had alluded to, um, the right side, the branch is a little different than the left side. The right side of the vagus nerve is more mood and behavior. Hence the idea that I would emphasize the right side. And certainly um, when we say vagus nerve, it, it's bilateral. So even though we say it's singularly, it's, it's bilateral, there's two nerves. So I'm big on um, upregulating the, uh, the vagus nerve on the right side. Um, at the same time, the auricular branch has been shown to have positive effects on autism, and that's where I personally have found that the red and violet, there's a good study that Arconia did, add that to the auricular right, just put the um, EVRL right in here, very simplistically. When we talk about autism, the last study that I read, 90% of autistic uh, children had leaky gut. So once again, we're clearly gonna end at the brain, because that is the ending point, if you will, we're gonna laser the gut, and we're also gonna laser bidirectionally uh, stimulating by using the vagus nerve. So everything that we're all talking about, we're all saying the same thing. It's, um, we're all singing the same song, except some are rock, some are country, some is disco or whatever. I'm giving my age away. But, but the bottom line is many of these things are, again, lifestyle, laser, and really that gut to brain, that brain to gut axis. I mean, when I looked at COVID-19, if I could just segue there, I know uh, that we're not talking about that. What I learned from that was it was gut to lung and gut to hypertension. And all that registered was where in the big chip called the brain. So um, once again, for the autism, we've got those studies coming out. Um, for ADHD, again, go to that vagus nerve, take away the sugar, take away the artificial coloring. And um, don't, I know we don't, and, and Simon, I'm gonna throw this out to you, right? I know we had uh, went back and forth on our next panel. So yeah. my suggestion for the next panel is uh, nutritional implementation or functional nutrition with low level laser therapy because we all keep talking about that a little and that really shows a synergistic uh, approach that we're all trying to purport with low level laser therapy in this uh, panel. Yeah, very good. Uh, Jake? Um, I love both those answers. Uh, one thing I come to back to with, the, with these kids is uh, the primary goal of the brain is movement. And that, that's not just a skeletal muscle, that's cardiac muscle, and that's oculars, and that's, that's your whole lot. But this idea that the brain is trying to move towards or away from a target. 
And what we see in a lot of these kids is that hypermobility, right? So they're all super, super hypermobile. So we evolved through producing movement, feeling what it was like, and, and getting that beautiful feedback system of, of, of um, doing something and, and getting feedback. And when we have hypermobility, you don't get so much feedback from, the, from those joints. So these kids don't get the feedback to feel what it was like. So I'll do the same things as, as, uh, as, as Trevor was mentioning. Um, but I also want to give them strength exercise, get them gripping things, put percusses on their hands, get them to, to engage with their hands and use, basically use tools so they get that feedback to the, the frontal areas. You, know, you come up with the idea, you think about how you want to activate it, how you want to do it, and you feel what was the result. Um, and if they're not feeling what that result was, then they're not going to develop the frontal areas more. So I want them to get engaged in, in games that get them manipulating things, puzzles, all that kind of stuff. At the same time, I have the, the laser over there and frontal cortex and cerebellum in particular um, and then using things like your cross call activities and, uh, and, and cross body activities to try and get some of that um, left and right hemisphere integration uh, that's my part thanks jake uh, rob sullivan we're going in that order Uh, it, it's not really my area, guys. Uh, it, it's something that I have a huge interest in. Uh, I think when I'm looking at things like this, I'll always look for uh, or try and identify which which part of the cortex is weak and, and, and try to aim to balance those. I think with everything that I do with a laser where possible, if it's an injury of some sort or a condition or, 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 or whatever, I always try to incorporate movement, cross movement, et cetera, into all of that to try and bring things back to balance. I don't have anything to add to this discussion because really it's not my field of practice. Uh, so I'm going to leave it to the experts. Great. Sorry, Kirk, you've, uh, because you went out and you were back in again, you're showing fit. So uh, over to you. He's I, I, me. That's all right. That's right. So for me, this one's really personal because uh, growing up, I had ADHD. So I know what it's like going through school, struggling with that. I was the classic kid who would do his homework and then forget it or, you know, tune out as the teacher's talking, always in trouble because I couldn't sit still. Uh, and then I had adult ADHD as well. I even had Tourette's as a kid, too. So I had uh, different tics. I had uh, blinking, grunting, whistling, all these things. So I know what it's like going through that. Um, as an adult, uh, the uh, ADHD was affecting my practice too, and those lasers were instrumental in, in helping that. So definitely everything everybody else has said is, is phenomenal. One, and I do the same thing too with incorporating movement and the, the type of stimulation they're talking about. One different thing that I've done with myself, guinea pigging myself too, is I've used some other devices stacked with my laser that are very inexpensive. So I've used on my phone, there's some apps called Binaural Beats or Braindroid that send different frequencies of sound into your ears to create brainwave entrainment to and you can set it on different ones that are pre-programmed. I did it to stimulate the frontal lobe since that's where I had a lot of weaknesses. And so I would have those going while I did the laser on the settings that Dr. Barry talked about for 10 minutes, I would do that. Or I'd use a Muse headband too that has a little EEG sensor that sends a signal to your phone that will give you uh, basically really inexpensive biofeedback of how your brain waves are functioning in the front of the frontal lobe. That if you're focused, you will hear it uh, very quiet and calm and hear some birds popping out. And if your brain waves aren't very controlled in the frontal lobe you're going to be all over the place and hear this uh, loud wind and rain and I stack that with the laser at the same time and that's one thing I'll do with some of my patients too is I'll stick them on like say the, the Muse device with the laser at the same time I can do a 10 minute session it'll take them through a guided meditation um, as I leave and we see really good results with stacking those two things together and, uh, and it's a lot of fun too the patients enjoy it uh, I enjoy it as well too. Hey, thanks for that Simon, very much, Kurt. Yeah. Simon, one last little quick hitter for clinical. Um, on the autistic kids on EEG studies, on the spectrum kids, they tend to lack alpha and theta uh, bandwidth activity. So as part of that four hertz and that 10 hertz, that's what that's one of the reasons why we use that in our protocols for the spectrum kids. Uh, second thing that we see on the spectrum is that they tend to have high levels of aluminum in the brain. And I'm not going to go down the vaccine rabbit hole, but obviously these kids are getting high levels of aluminum somewhere. And I highly doubt it's from drinking Pepsi and cooking with aluminum cookware when they're one year old. But um, so we like magnesium malate. It's a nice gentle chelator of aluminum. And Dr. Silverman brought up that point earlier about the NMDAR, the receptor that's very important to have um, that, that 
decrease in that excess calcium influx, and that is protected by a magnesium plug. And the form of magnesium that's been shown across the blood-brain barrier is called magnesium L3 and 8. So those are two forms of magnesium that I'd highly, highly, highly recommend because a lot of our audience will know about the magnesium that's more for like gut motility and muscle relaxation, and that's all great. We, we're very deficient as a society in magnesium these days, but magnesium L3 and 8 and magnesium malate are definitely underutilized. Hey, Cy, I, I'm, yeah. I'm jumping on what he said. It's great. Magnesium L3 and 8. I know you have a concussion uh, question. I don't know if we'll get to it. Uh, studied September 2016, published magnesium L3 and 8, just like uh, Dr. Barry said, crosses, crosses the blood-brain barrier, increases bioavailable magnesium in the brain by 15%, 50% in the cerebral spinal fluid, has shown to decrease brain aging by 9 to 14 years. Imagine coupling that with low-level laser. It's two grams. Wow. It's inexpensive. Like I said, I don't need to be the smartest guy in the room. I just need to get things done. And uh, C stands for cheater and chiropractic. I will do anything to get them better. So I had that nutrition. And that uh, magnesium L3 and 8 is a great point. It's inexpensive. And every chiropractor should add it to their armamentarium. Yeah, that's great advice, uh, Rob. Actually, I, I've gone through Martin's question straight to Sarah's because I'm conscious of Trevor's time. And I know Sarah wanted to address Trevor specifically with this, but quickly before we go there, a question from Sarah Steele, who uh, we've just watched her two videos. We may as well answer this now while we're on that topic. She's saying, based on the gut-brain link, green neurodegenerative diseases, opinions on ketogenic or carnivore diets. Bob Silverman, do you want to take that one? Uh, I think everybody's going to want to chime in because you know what? If we had a panel, it's not necessarily laser on diets, it'd be worse than a political panel. People would be bleeding in about 30 seconds. It, it's just unbelievable. I can just tell you this, I'm American. They have nicknamed our diet SAD, the standard American diet. I don't know a good parlance to say it, our diets suck. I mean, it's just bad. And not like the guys here that are watching what they eat and everything like that. Too much sugar, too much wheat, too much gluten. Having said all that, I would be more for a ketogenic diet. The studies are really robust especially for brain. So essentially 75% fat, 20% protein, 5% carbohydrate. We want to make ketone bodies. The gold medal winner of the ketone body is beta hydroxybutyrate. Fabulous for uncoupling at the cell membrane. Ketones, fats are energy for the brain, not carbohydrates. I would love to get into a padded room with a few people that said, Rob, you'll do better in great on your grades. You'll get a better SAT. Have some carbohydrates. You'll do better in chiropractic school. Have a banana versus an avocado. It was wrong. Speaking to or segueing all the way back to diabetes type three. So the ketogenic diet is a great choice. Two caveats. I'll send you a blog. There's a clean versus dirty keto. So the <laughs> The clean keto is, you know, stop eating like the crappy sausage and stop eating like, you know, dairy and things like that. The clean keto is more whole foods. In addition to that, with the ketogenic diet, the other caveat is limit to a certain extent the amount of coconut or coconut oil consumption because that raises what we call LPS. LPS is an endotoxin and that can set you along the path of leaky gut, damage to the gut brain axis. I am a ketogenic diet fan. Studies have shown it does not, and I repeat this, does not increase over a duration of time cholesterol or any of those adverse markers on blood. I see Trevor ready to jump out and go, give me some ketone bodies. I'm ready in NCT oil and ketone salts. <laughs> Trevor? <laughs> I'll, let the, I'll let the other guys jump in. Go ahead, you guys. I'll, I'll come back around to it. Like my, my, my favorite on this is I love this whole keto thing. Like my favorite um, go-to, I think Simon knows this, my favorite go-to is this thing on Netflix called The Magic Pill. Um, well worth a watch. It, it very much goes into a lot of what we're talking about here. And if you have a look at that, that film, what you will actually see is you will see an Econia laser in it if you watch it very carefully. Uh, but it, it, it really is well worth a watch. And I'm a big fan of the keto. Here you go, Rob, just for you. <laughs> My own saturated fats. <laughs> Trevor. 
Well, I, I, you know, to Dr. Silverman's point, I obviously we cycle patients through ketosis. Uh, it's not something you sustain ongoing. We do it in cycle. I, I, the way I describe it to my patients is I call it the mother nature diet and people look at me cross-eyed like I've never heard of the mother nature diet, but what I tell my patients is what did mother nature put on this planet for us to eat? That's what you want to consume. She gave us lots of fresh organic plants and that's what we want as our basis. We want to eat red meat, just make sure it's grass fed, grass finished, just like fish, make sure it's wild caught. Not, you know, anytime man gets a hold of something, we tend to screw it up. So, you know, we GMO stuff and, you know, high fructose corn syrup and all these man-made chemicals, like that's not something our, our body assimilates. So really just kind of think of it from that simple perspective and you're going to do well brain and gut wise on that, on, as well as the rest of the body and inflammation reduction. Great. Uh, Kirk, um, uh, Jake, anything to add to that? Yeah, just going along that line of what Trevor just said is there's even a little saying that uh, I don't know where I picked it up, but I use with the, with the patients is that if it's made in a plant, don't eat it. But if it is a plant or eats plants, eat it. It's a simple way to remember that. <laughs> that's great. Jake? Yeah, I completely agree. I, I, that's exactly the same as my patients. It's, it's just the cooks. Imagine you're a hunter gatherer. Are you going to yeah. find a field of wheat? If you look at how hard it is to make flour, how much wheat you have to have to make enough flour to make a loaf of bread, like it doesn't, maize is incredibly hard to grow. You have to make sure you get rid of every other weed in the field. It needs no stones, it needs a meticulous thing. So you go for the low hanging fruit, you go for the stuff you can pluck off a tree and the, the, the animals you can catch. So uh, I haven't looked much at, she mentioned uh, just looking at um, carnivore diets. So the only thing I've looked at is some of these African tribes where they have nothing but they just eat, their, they have a, a livestock of cows and they just eat raw cow meat and they drink blood and they drink raw milk and then they have amazing life expectancies and all this other stuff. And up until that point, I'd always thought you have to have your five or 10 fruit, fruit and veg a day and otherwise you're going to die a horrible death. Whereas you've got these guys out there living to amazing ages with very low disease based on nothing but meat. However, just to raise that angry fist that uh, Robert suggested, the, the world cannot survive with all of us just having purely meat. So I think I'm still sticking with the uh, fruit and veg, some meat and, and less grains and uh, that lot. I'm all for it, my friend. I'm all for it. Just remember where we live. Our soils here in America, they are uh, depleted of all the needed nutrients that we need. I think we have 7% of our soil available. That's where we are for organic growth. And, and you guys don't have that. So your flower is different than ours. And that's why uh, we were talking about coming and moving over there and hanging out with you guys for perpetuity. Well, we're pretty bad too. I think now it's worldwide. I'm a gardener, guys. I, I, I grow stuff. That's why now you found my passion spot outside of, uh, outside of work. Um, I think it's 90% of the world's farms are on severely depleted soil now, which is crazy. If you think the nutritional value of your, of your food that's coming off a farm is terrible. So people need to be getting back in the gardens and, and using, making their own, own compost and own mulch because it's going to have so much, more, so much more nutrition. We had some peas off out of the vet garden yesterday. The flavor, they're so sweet. They're so sweet. There's so much, you can taste there's more nutrition in there. So we should all be doing that. That's my rant over. Apologies. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's great points, Jake. Great points. Right, guys, we'll move on to Sarah Wilkinson here. Uh, uh, neurotherapy works. Uh, let me try to click on her link. Here we are. Hi guys, um, my question to the panel is with regards to spasticity. I treat a lot of patients with neurological injury or neurodegenerative conditions. Many of them suffer from um, increased spasticity or increased tone. I'm just wondering whether you have used the laser specifically um, for spasticity and what effect you found. Thank you. That's great. Thanks for that, Sarah. Uh, Sarah's who I talked to you about, Trevor, is a, a neurophysio across here in the UK. So do you want to get started, please? Sure can. So Simon, just real quick, I'm going to answer this. I'm going to jump off, see a patient. I'm going to try and jump back on if I can. Um, a couple of things. So with, with spasticity, obviously with that upper motor neuron activity, that increased tone, um, we use lasers at multiple levels. We use it at a local tissue level. So what I'll do with my lasers is um, 
really with spasticity, if you look at what the main medical intervention is, is that they'll use things like intrathecal baclofen, for example, to create a GABAergic inhibitory effect to relax the muscle. So when you look at GABA, again, that's coming back to that one hertz frequency, that's got a very strong GABAergic effect to it. So one of your base frequency settings for spasticity is going to be one hertz frequency. Now, with that said, what I'll do is I'll actually do local, say, just say a bicep, for example, say there's high spasticity at the elbow joint. What I'll do is I'll, I'll upregulate nerve root and bicep with the laser, and I may fire a GTO mechanism, more of like a gentle fast stretch and, um, to help uh, cause local relaxation just to see how they respond to that. But then we keep working upstream. I'll do vagal stim. I'll do frontal activation and we'll do things like that to see, I'll work my way up to see if lasers at any of those different levels do better with the spasticity and, or it's all the above. We'll, you know, we'll do multiple lasers at once. Like maybe I'm using my FX cerebellar frontal while I use my PL touch on the spastic limb. Um, another thing I want to bring up are things like eccentric loading and mirror therapy. So what I, I, I have right here, um, you know, just I, I think practices that are doing neural rehab should just get like a three foot long mirror because what we'll do is we'll use mirrors and this can be used in stroke rehab. This can be used in phantom limb syndromes. This can be used in, um, you know, the complex regional pain syndromes, things like that. Well, we'll cover the spastic limb with the mirror. Say it's my right arm. So what the, we do is we have the patient looking in the mirror and they're looking and it looks like it's their right arm, but it's actually their left arm, their good arm that they're looking at. So then what we'll do is we'll have them do exercises or therapies in the mirror where the brain starts to remap or retrain to say, oh, look at, I can straighten my arm out or I can straighten my wrist out or do whatever motion you're trying to do. And it shows it doing fluidly and without pain and, you know, for those different mechanisms. So I just want to bring that up. I, I know I'm kind of going to skim over this too briefly, but we'll use different algorithms to use mirrors to actually bring out the spasticity. Another thing we'll use is like um, eccentric loading. Like say we've got uh, a spastic elbow, we'll, we'll bring them across into an eccentric load, straighten their arm out and do therapies like that. And then we'll use things like K-taping in an eccentric fashion um, or you know, to bring it to a concentric fashion and that, that we leave them, we send them home like that, for example. So um, while we do the laser modality. So we love one hertz with spasticity. We love swimming upstream. We love using mirror therapies as just some examples of what I'll use in that setting. Yeah, Trevor, that's a fantastic answer. Uh, okay, well, we will let you go and I will, um, hopefully we'll get you back, but I'm, I'm gonna not, try and come back on. Let me go see a patient. I'll be back shortly. No problem. Thanks a lot, Trevor. Uh, Rob Silverman, do you wanna take the next, next bit? Yeah, I, I pulled a couple of studies when I saw that video this morning, one of which was stroke rehab and vagus nerve stimulation. It was from Stroke Magazine, November 2018. Essentially, uh, stimulating the vagus nerve enhanced structural plasticity and motor networks. So that, that was one. Two, I got a couple of other studies here that spoke about the red light, which had an effective natural muscle recovery strategy in multi hundreds of peer-reviewed studies. Uh, those citations, again, I can send to you there. Both these articles are from, or all three actually are from 2015 to 2018. Um, some other things I do for some spasticity, um, a lot of times I'll have people uh, cross from right to left. I know Jake's almost ready to nod his head and I'll laser the brain. So um, I don't necessarily use the mirror. I think the mirror is great. That, that was a new concept to me. I'm gonna email him and, and get that. But um, I do, again, a lot of vagus nerve and a lot of red light has shown to decrease spasticity. A patient come in yesterday that took an EMG study and they could not figure out why he had spasticity of his pectoral muscles. So I um, did similar things, contract and relax and laser. And he just noted literally on my phone now, he says that the spasticity and the um, uh, tightness of the muscle is decreased about 80%. So, um, you know, it's always great to have these conversations. It's always great to bring something that you see in your office uh, to this. Yeah, great uh, intro, Rob. Uh, Jake? Yeah, that's great. I, I, um, 
along a similar sound. I like the idea of it's that descending inhibition that you've, you've lost. So the link to give you that descending inhibition is gone. And so what I'll do is the same thing, laser over the frontal cortex or you know, whatever areas you want to go for. Um, but I might have them cognitively engaged with trying to, in, to yep. give that inhibition as well. So let's say we're doing, uh, let's say they've got a, a positive Babinski's and they've got a bit of withdrawal as well. I'll have them cognitively watch the foot, and as I do the reflex, try to try to fight it basically. So try and do the opposite. So if you think when you're activating, if I'm trying to curl my arm, I'm activating biceps at the same time. I'm inhibiting triceps, right, to stop that spasticity and allow me just to move my arm smoothly. So I'll have them do the opposite to whatever the spasticity is. So I'll try and get reflex, because that's often easier, um, but have them actively try and do the opposite motion to to engage that neurology to to allow them to build that inhibition again. Um, remember that the, the number of inhibitory synapses massively outweighs the excitatory synapses. So if we lose that inhibitory, we're in trouble. You know, we want to do everything we can. So I'll bring in cognition and all kind of exercises that uh, Robert and uh, um, Trevor have already, already mentioned. Thanks, Jake. Rob Sullivan. I suppose I, I would be a bit like Trevor in this, um, like you've seen my clinic, Simon. We use mirrors hugely. Um, in fact, my main room where the, the lasers are, um, we have mirrors completely across one wall. And sometimes what we'll find, like I would do a lot of things with telepase, spastic legs, and uh, and things like this. And it's, it's almost like, I suppose, not trying to make it too simple, but I'm not a chiropractor, so for me, simple is good. Um, what I like to try and do is, I like to think of it in terms of this arm is fine, this one isn't fine. I can see this one in the mirror as being fine, I can see this one as not being fine. So if I can remove that fine one and replace it with, with the fine one, remove the bad one, then I can get the brain to start looking at the body in a different way. So for me, it's 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 all about re-establishing neural links. And again, it's like this this descending thing because somewhere something is isn't going to be to be working properly. Because like what's really happening is you know it, it's it, what is it? it it's a, it's an altered skeletal muscle performance issue. And and sometimes you know a lot of things in in, in in terms of surgery, a lot a lot of surgery is done because it's a, it's it's a spasticity issue. It isn't necessarily a joint issue, and it's it, it's all misdone. So what I try to do is use one part of the body which is normal, which is normal to that person, to educate the other part of the body that behaves in a different way. And I will always try, like Trevor is saying, there to map one one side to the other. And it does like from my point of view it it does work particularly well again my, my protocols for this are very much like i spoke to you about earlier a state of confusion so i i basically tend to use the, my own what i would refer to as state of confusion uh program which is basically 493360 um and and for me that tends to work but i mean the thing with all of this guys is look it's it's about electromagnetic transfer it's better about getting energy into the body my principle with all of this stuff is our body has everything we need to work properly. It's just for some reason we don't have access to that. And the access is denied because of lack of energy, lack of nerve transport, lack of potential. If we get the laser on there, if we get that electromagnetic energy transport going, then with skills in terms of this mirror, my arm does this, I can see it as if it's this arm doing it, then I can remap the whole system. And we can get things that don't function properly to function properly because it's just a case of allowing the body to see that this actually moves the way that it should. And I think it's a case of the body, is, it's kind of like the whole monkey see, monkey do thing. If we can allow the body to see what it's not doing and allow it to experience what it is doing, then it will just map it over. Anyway bit simple, but I'm just a podiatrist. Simple is good for me. Uh, Kirk. Great, thanks, Rob. Kirk? You know, I, that's been so well covered. I think everybody, I, there's nothing different that I do that's not already been said. So uh, great job, guys, on that one. Cool. We'll uh, move um, on to the previous one. Oh, sorry. Um, sorry. That's okay, Sam. Go on, Jake. Sarah's probably aware of this already, but one, one that's got good research behind it is being a complete jerk so let's say someone can't use their right hand uh they'll have a tendency to very quickly become left hand dominant and do all that stuff there's some really good research for being a, a jerk and saying right left hand goes in your pocket or i'll tie it behind mm -hmm. your back 
uh, and you are now right-handed. And even if they've got the most terrible spasticity, saying for an hour a day, tough, get on with it. Um, you know, necessity is the mother of invention, and, and they will. You'll be amazed that if you force someone to use that hand, how much uh, functionality can come back. So, yeah. not doing any clever rehab laser stuff. Just saying, tough, get on with it. I don't, I don't care that it's frustrating that you can't do your hair, you can't have a drink. Make it happen, and they'll, they'll find ways to start off initially, and then very slowly as they start to get that cognitive de- uh, inhibition, it, it kind of yeah. recover remarkably. Maybe not to a perfect hand, but to, to one that is at least functional. Right. Yeah, definitely. Okay, this question is from Martin. He, uh, he's always greets you guys with a rather uh, colourful. Um, intro so i will put martin on hello to the five laser lights of the round table it's me again uh first of all thank you very much for your input this is my last questions found it very informative and very helpful i'm afraid i'm back again for a little bit more we are currently treating a professional rugby league player at practice who suffered from multiple concussions affecting his ability to concentrate and his sleep patterns. So with that in mind, I thought that I would tap into maybe Dr. Gear's expertise in sports injuries uh, and just kind of inquire about what sort of clinical gems I could utilize uh, to, to maximize the benefit of the laser therapy. But if so, I was hoping that Dr. Silverman would maybe be able to point in the direction of some nutrition support so that I could take a, um, a triple pronged approach using the laser and nutrition, and of course, the muscular sleeping protocols that I've used for the last 22 years. Um, so I'd very much appreciate uh, the collective input into this particular case and look forward to your um, advice. Um, I hope you're all keeping safe and well through this COVID crisis and my regards to to your families thank you once again that's great thanks for that martin uh, as he referred to kirk right at the start kirk do you want to start with this and then rob silverman sure. can finish with the nutritional side sure sure so when it comes to like with these athletes first of all i want to see how bad is he because i have a whole wide range of concussed athletes coming into my practice from ones who are just having some performance issues let's say if i've got an, a, a baseball player who's having now issues tracking a ball or a football player your your version of football where they're having trouble you know kicking the ball and uh, or like you know some uh, some some different coordination issues to where i've got some that are so severe that they're coming into my office with you know uh really dark sunglasses on and nausea and can't hardly handle anything so let's say if he's really really severe i will start with just getting the laser on on him transcranially that's where if they're really really bad we'll do that if they're super severe i won't even start with it on the head i'll start with it on the body to see how they can tolerate that um a lot of the times with those basic frequencies like trevor i know loves to use just one 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 and one with these really recently concussed types of patients so we've been using that also in the office um, if they're not that bad let's say if they're now getting better and it's just like say a concentration of focus and their play is not as not as good then i'll go through things and i like to do what everybody talks about is up regulation i like to call it recalibration just i'll go through and i'll test their muscles and see which muscles are weak when i find a weak muscle then i'm going to laser over the nerve roots to try to activate that pathway and get that muscle to be strong because i want to start from the periphery and then come to the head so we'll do this with the lower extremity like say test the quadriceps test the hamstrings test the the gastrox the glutes etc and again if it's weak i'll just laser over the spine or over that muscle for about five to 10 seconds to try to get some energy into that pathway, get the brain to what I like to call, you know, recalibrate it and reset it after that head trauma. But we'll do it with the upper extremity, testing the biceps, the triceps, deltoid, et cetera. If something's weak, we'll laser over the nerve roots in the cervical spine. Then I'll go up and put the laser on transcranially and I'll start with doing some different uh, stimulation to cranial nerves. So I find that a lot of these athletes, especially for athletic performance, will have issues with eye tracking, eye focus, convergence, et cetera, and accommodation. So I'll actually just have them sit under there. If they can tolerate, I'll do some stimulation with the pen light. I'll have them follow me with the cardinal fields of gaze. I'll have them focus on a point on the wall, move their head back and forth while they're focused on that point. And you can go through different cranial nerves, um, you know, 
hearing, facial movements, etc. My little way of seeing if there's an issue is I like to look at the brain and say, uh, if we're going to try to get to multitask, do we get it to, to fail when we're opening a bunch of programs at once? So, for example, I'll find a strong muscle, say, in the uh, anterior deltoid. I'll test it if it's strong. Then I'll stimulate the brain with a pen light. And if that goes weak, then I want to try to stimulate that brain with that pen light until I can get that muscle to be activated at the same time that this pathway uh, through the eyes is, 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 is active as well, too, to where your brain can multitask. Then we'll go and I'll do the same thing. I'll test that muscle, see if it's strong, have them do a cardinal fields of gaze coming across this way and hold it here. If it blows out weak, then we know we're going to laser while going in that direction. And then we'll test it in each different direction here to see if them holding the eyes up and out, down and out, uh, up and out to the other side, down and to the other side. If any of those make it weak, then I'm going to laser them while I have them hold in that position or move across until that arm goes strong. So that's one of my little methods there. I'll usually do around 10 minutes um, uh, with the patient. And then I'm always checking for them too and saying, hey, look, as I do this stimulation, I may make you feel a little off. You might feel a little wonky. Uh, to let me know on your next visit, did I go too far? Did I push you too far? Because you have to customize it with that concussed athlete to see what they're able to tolerate uh you it's like exercise you want to do enough to make them a little sore but not so much that they can't get out of bed for the next few days so if i can work their brain with a laser on uh and make them feel just a little off that's okay i don't want to make them feel completely crashed out so that's the method i'll use with concussions uh dr rob i'll send it over to you for what you do nutritionally on top of that you got it um so i'm going to give you the overview of the options uh, ultimately, um, maybe we can come back. We take literally like 15 minutes because they break it up into different phases, combining the gut and the brain. So let's go over just some choices, and then I'll give you the three or five that I would recommend. Number one, we talked about the ketogenic diet. So obviously, I want to get them into ketosis. If I get somebody who's concussed, what I do right away, they come in an acute concussion, is I will give them MCT oil, and I will also give them what we call the ketone salts. The ketone salts will have exogenous... Um, beta hydroxybutyrate with the salt. The salt's really there for um, electrolytes, so I get them right into ketosis. The other things I recommend, shocking as it may seem, is creatine. Creatine is shown to be very positive for short and long-term amnesia. It's good, quick, quality energy to the brain. Uh, fish oil, if we had hours, I wouldn't be able to cover all that I could with fish oils. Fish oils are precursors to what we call pro-resolving mediators, which I'll segue into. Fish oils are great for cell membrane health. Fish oils have been shown in a multitude of studies to have a positive recovery effect after concussion, both at the cell membrane and axonal level. And as a key takeaway, everybody listening, if you have a patient that is involved in some sort of contact collision sport, fish oils precipitously decrease the incidence of concussions. And as we all know, talk to those females because they are much more susceptible for a multitude of reasons than men. One of the biggest reasons, and I'm doing that because I saw Trevor come back and Jay are there, is their microglials are different than the guys, but uh, there's multiple other reasons. Turmeric, turmeric decreases the NF-kappa B pathway. So it decreases this proverbial release of interleukin cytokine storms. It also upregulates the NRF2 antioxidant pathway. Alpha lipoic acid, for me, I'm shocked that people don't use alpha lipoic acid more. Works with the watery and the fat part of the cell. Great for nerves. You mix that with PEA, and you've got the panacea for peripheral nerves and possible axonal regeneration. Pro-resolving mediators. I just did a paper on that. It should be coming out. Pro-resolving mediators are these... Um, precursors that allow what we call resolvins, protectins, and maricins to come out. Essentially, they allow for the resolution of inflammation, and they allow for the homostasis between the initiation and the resolution of inflammation. You mix that together with low-level laser, and you've got a great chance of a good, positive microenvironment of not lack of inflammation in the brain. Interestingly enough, Low-level laser is able to convert fish oils to pro-resolving mediators. There was a study I can share with everybody on that. Choline. Choline is a great brain development. A um, lot of studies now showing that it's great for Alzheimer's. Vitamin D, hormone D, I mean, goodness gracious. Neuroprotective. How many enzymatic reactions does it allow? Vitamin D, so it's D3. 
I'm going to give you 5,000 IUs as a generic point, but definitely D3 with K2, so there's no placking, and uh, K2 to K1 in about a 10 to 1 ratio. Zinc, great central nervous system. Sulforaphane, sulforaphane is from cruciferous vegetables, helps with the blood-brain barrier, especially at MMP9. And we talked before, we gave a great uh, conversation on magnesium l 3 That may be my number one go-to. L-glutathione, I'm a big proponent of liposomal glutathione. Glutathione shown in studies in 2014 to decrease brain tissue damage by 70%. It's a top three for me. And taurine, taurine's great because it works at the gut with the bile, but taurine's great because it blocks um, the stimulation of excital toxicity. So having said all of that, my top three are pro-resolving mediators, omega-3 fatty acids, and um, I'm having a moment to L-glutathione. Now, you can pick off the list. There's a million other things there, but there's your cherry tree feast. Brilliant, Rob. Thanks very much for that. Um, Jake, do you want to add anything to that? We'll just go in, in order of how you appear there. That's great. Uh, that was amazing. I thought Kirk was fantastic as well. Um, I think the research shows that the ideal people who have a concussion have a change in eye movement and they have a change in balance. Um, so those are two areas of, of your assessment you particularly want to look at and two areas of rehab that you definitely want to look at. Uh, for those reasons, the, you know, change in eye movement, change in balance, you're going to start seeing that I think it's men have 90% of them will complain of some kind of body pain and I think it's about 60% of women. Um, Kirk did a great job describing what he does therapy. Just to add a little bit to that, if they can't tolerate, let's say their vestibular system, cerebral system, or whatever it is, is, is shot. I'm getting excited. I can hear myself talking too fast, so I'm going to slow down. <laughs> if their systems are shot, they may not be able to do your rehab while um, standing. So just trying to control themselves against gravity can be using up so much brain power that your therapy smashes them. Um, so quite often I have them do it supine. You're taking gravity out of the equation. They're not having to worry about stabilizing their neck, back, and all the other joints. And then you can do your VOR exercises while they're supine. And uh, you can do your passive, your active, your cross crawls, your isometrics, um, whatever it would be to activate the brain and, and either give passive or active, um, you know, passive inactive out or whatever it is. But they're supine. And then from there, go to sitting. From there, go to standing. The other thing we see a lot in concussion is that the autonomic nerve system is shot. So now they can't tolerate going from lying to standing. You know, all the blood pools in their, in their feet, it drains out of their head. Now their brain doesn't have the, the blood and the nutrient, uh, the oxygen and other nutrients to do its job properly. So they feel crappy all the time. I've got a guy who emailed me yesterday, said when he stands up, he's a fireman. This guy's like a really strong, fit guy. When he's standing up, his resting heart rate is 180 beats a minute. Imagine just you're just standing. You're not even trying to do your job or anything else, and your heart rate is, is almost like at your maximum for a, like a 35 year old. Um, so again, you want to go and look at your tilt table tests and, and look at therapy to get that autonomic nervous system to work better. Um, yeah, that's my bit. Great, thanks, Jake. Rob Sullivan. Sorry, I was muted. Um, all I can say is I think you guys got this. I'm good. <laughs> it's an education just listening, Rob. So thanks for that. Uh, Trevor, did yeah. you did you get the question at the start? Yeah, you were probably victimized like, by uh, what everybody. Yeah, Max was he was asking about the post concussive stuff, correct? Yeah. Martin, yeah. yes. Um, yeah. So that's uh, you know it's something that uh, you know the guys did a great job of, of discussing some of the things. We'll use the laser uh, methodology with regards to the autonomic regulation. Doctor Cook started to bring up. Uh, the dysautonomia stuff like POTS and things like that. One of the things I want the docs to keep in mind is that we know the red laser will increase parasympathetic tone, like in heart rate variability, it'll increase the high frequency activity. So if you're having like tachycardia, for example, increase autonomic function, you can use the red laser to, to help that parasympathetic tone. And conversely, for those that have the violet, you can use violet laser to increase sympathetic tone at different times. So we use that at different like tilt table and different angulation. I love that Dr. Cook brought up that sensory mismatch and different things that happen in the brainstem. When you get concussed and that brain just floating around in that CSF, 
you can even it's not just from the metabolic cascade like where your brain kind of shuts down and has all this this whole different cascade of nmda excitotoxicity and whatnot but you can also have diffuse axonal injury and whatnot so when the brain's getting knocked around some of the areas that are most vulnerable are going to be like your brain stem right there so you can actually get axonal damage well, that happens to be where a lot of your autonomic centers are in that pontomedullary medullary area, for example. So you can get a mismatch of your ocular stuff, your inner ear stuff, and your neck and muscle feedback. And you have to make sure one of the biggest problems with post-concussive stuff is there's a mismatch between those three centers. It's going to be way too deep for me to get into on this, but keep in mind that that's right in that cranial nerve eight area of involvement. Well, when you do things like vagal stim or brainstem laser stim, you help bring up the energy and the rehab and the BDNF and all the things you need to do to repair that area, just like Dr. Silverman talked about with the spinal cord injury stuff. So keep in mind, vagal stim is not only good for everyone that has a concussion will develop, basically the research is showing, will develop leaky gut and potentially leaky brain. So right away, we're doing vagal stim for that, but you're also doing it for the brain stem integrators. The other big issue is that hypothalamic pituitary axis, the adrenal function, the gonadal function, and the thyroid function. Dr. Gare speaks to thyroid better than anyone on the planet. He will talk to you about his different thyroid protocols. Um, we can use lasers even in upregulation of ovarian and testicular output because almost invariably in chronic concussions you see, especially in males, they tend to lack testosterone, females, progesterone is a big one, and then adrenal function. So we use it on that HP axis realm as well. So there's a couple of different things that you'll typically see in chronic post-concussive stuff. I won't get too much into the Fung Neuro with things like collicular mapping and tonotopic, somatotopic mapping. Now we'll save that for another when I come overseas, but uh, just keep those things in mind too. You always wanna look downstream. Uh, lipopolysaccharides, like Dr. Silverman has been talking about, that leaky barrier system inflames the, the system and keeps the brain inflamed. And now you're in this constant state of cyclical inflammation because of the leaky gut, the food sensitivities, the bacteria and stuff getting in and flaming the brain. The other big thing I'll mention, I'll leave it at this, is that when you get hit, you need inflammation in certain areas of, of healing, just like with the cytokine stuff with COVID. We need inflammation, but we also have to be able to turn it off and have that immunomodulatory effect. So when a, when a brain gets hit, when it gets concussed, do not let that person back on the field too quick because otherwise if they get hit again within that three week span, they're gonna be primed. That glial system is gonna be mad for over 16 weeks. And if they get hit again, it may stay primed and have that permanent M1 phenotypical alteration where the, the brain inflammation can't turn off. The good thing about lasers is it's one of the only modalities that we've seen that can actually turn that M2 that M1 to M2 glial resolution. So you wanna make sure when somebody gets concussed, no matter what you know about concussions, get that laser on the brain within that first week so that you actually protect them. Heaven forbid they get hit again, you can actually bring that gliosis down and decrease the priming of it. Yeah, Trevor, that was a fantastic answer. Very good. Um, that was Martin who was, uh, I moved on to Max there. Uh, before oh, sorry, I, I apologize, sir. Oh, no, it's fine. Um, before I move on to Max, has anybody got anything else to add to what Trevor's just said? Take that as a no. No, that's uh, well said, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, right, guys, Max Atkinson. Max first attended uh, Rob Silverman's Gut to Brain Access seminar he did in London on 30th of November last year, and he got an EVRL laser. Um, in the last month, Max has also invested in an FX635 laser. Now, one of the areas of his question here is regarding a friend of his, because he has the FX at home, he hasn't introduced it to the clinic yet, he's only just gone back to work, uh, who has had chronic plantar fasciitis for the last seven years. I think she's a very uh, heavy set lady, maybe around sort of the 18 stone mark. Um, hasn't been able to get rid of this condition um for seven years basically uh he's done around six treatments with the laser and you need probably a little bit more patience uh, but any more guidance anybody can give him on it as you will hear from him we much uh, appreciated because she has a job where she's standing on her feet all the time it's one of those sort of qvc channels so that obviously does not help the things with the weight as well so um let me put this on now guys
Hi everyone. Um, hope you're all well. Many thanks for taking these questions. Um, sorry to be with you for the actual live event, uh, but I'll assist the recording later. Um, I've been using EVRL now for about six months and recently purchased the FX 6 v 5 which is at home, and I'm using that for uh, testing uh, on the few patients, uh, friends, actually, that have got one's on a really stubborn, chronic plantar fasciitis for seven-year history, and the other one with uh, a chronic brachialgia, um, carpal tunnel syndrome. Um, so I'm, I'm using that and sort of familiarizing myself with, um, with the FX at home, EVRL in clinic, mainly really using it for MSK stuff at the moment, not got into much of the brain side of things. So just any help regarding use of the EVRL for troubleshooting would be uh, really helpful, um, both for neuro stuff as well as just um, MSK. Um, I'd just like to know how to, to get the most out of that for the diagnostic side, because I know that um, a few of you uh, use it uh, as, a, as a diagnostic tool, uh, sort of, you know, deciding when, then where to, to uh, hit rather than just necessarily um, using one protocol and maybe then using a few different ones. So that would be really useful. Um, the plantar fasciitis, be, I, we are, I'm struggling a bit with this, um, this friend. She's had six treatments now with the FX and virtually no response. Um, she is doing her stretching um, and I can't think of anything else other than she's using orthotics, which I fitted as well. And she has used a few different styles in the past with no help. Um, so I'm just struggling as to um, whether any other um, protocols or frequency change would help her more. And in terms of the brain side of it, um, you just know when I do start using that, um, what the sort of timescales are likely to be recommended. So are you thinking, you know, a six week protocol, um, twice a week, or something like that? Um, how many sessions, time frame in between? exercises that can be used as well to help uh, would be very useful. So particularly I'm thinking initially getting started on using it more for sort of, you know, those patients with uh, migraine issues, for example, um, or for um, chronic pain, you know, regional pain syndrome. Um, be useful to know, again, also on the protocols, I've probably gone a little bit over the top with, with looking at specific frequencies. I've got the uh, uh, the book at home, the manual. Um, <laughs> it's like a thousand different ones in there, so I'm I'm thinking I'm, I'm just going to get lost in that. So maybe it'd be better just to stick with with a few uh, and use those. So any help you can uh, give me on all those questions would be very useful. Uh, sorry if I rambled a bit. Um, I hope to see you at a live event soon. Many thanks. That's great, Max. Thanks very much for that. Uh, so just to recap, uh, troubleshooting on the EVRL. Um, chronic plantar fasciitis patients, any help regarding that, um, protocols, things like migraine, region, regional pain syndrome, etc. Uh, I think Rob Silverman, do you want to get us underway? Sure. Uh, for the plantar fasciitis, so he was either in the 635, you know, um, I, I thought the podiatrists who did the study were brilliant in that they pointed it at the dar dorsal pedal artery. So also with plantar fascia, to me, I call it a misnomer because it's not truly plantar fascia because the plantar fascia is both medial and lateral on the foot. It's more plantar apioneurosis. However, plantar fascia is more neurogenic. So you probably, from what the studies reveal, it's about 50% in the tarsal tunnel, which is in the medial side underneath the ankle. Um, in addition, you're also getting something called Baxter's neuropathy, which is that brand. So you got about 70 to 75% is really nerve involvement. In theory, the FX635 should get it. In theory, you're going to do better as time goes on. And that's one of the things that maybe everybody in a panel at some point can talk about. You know, all these studies, the, the one that I did, the one that Trevor did, other ones, we saw this vertiginous drop, but yet it continued to drop in pain after we stop treating them. I mean, what other treatment does that? So to speak to the idea of what uh, Rob Sullivan said about uh, magnetic uh, therapy of transfer of energy, essentially, that's very positive. I'm a big proponent in movement. I believe that we should nerve floss with the plantar fascia. So I'll do what we call a tibial nerve floss. I'll send you a video because I'd have to stick my foot in front of everybody. You know, I'm pretty sure that everybody, one, doesn't want to see it, and two, they may be so uh, keen. They may think that it's odious. Um, so that's number one. You know, you want to do that. So, Max, add that. We met. We talked. 
you can, you know, just because the average is six visits, again, it's an average, it could be a few more. Um, having both lasers, definitely add both lasers. Um, to speak to the EVRL, since I like that um, a lot, I use all the handhelds equally. Got my EVO right over here. The whole premise is, so when I lecture, I'll muscle test the C5 and somebody will go weak. I'll use the red light, turns them on, turns them on ATP oxygenation, neurotransmission. Then I come back in a violet light and they go weak and everybody stands there and thinks Rob did something magical. I'm David Copperfield. But basically I uncloaked the hidden weakness. I gave a sympathetic response to the cell membrane. The gentleman on the panel can go into more detail if they'd like and they go weak. And then I add both violet but I would use the violet light as a diagnostic tool to kind of uncloak a hidden weakness. Migraines, there's a movement, I'll send you a video also that I do um, with a ner what we call a nerve entrapment and a myofascial release with a migraine. So Max, you're right on it. I'm gonna get you those videos and I'm gonna turn it over to my esteemed colleagues. Okay, actually if I, uh, Trevor, I don't know if you have other patients there. Do you wanna come in now just in case you have to go? No, I, I've got a second. I've got all my back office staff is doing a bunch of neuro rehab. So go ahead, Dr. Cook. Okay, go on, Jake. Almost to the order, yeah. <laughs> no problem. Yeah, I love what Robert said about uh, Tarleton. Um, so I think if you've got a, a condition like bath fasciitis that isn't resolving, um, you might want to double check that diagnosis, and you might you might be spot on. And it's just a woman who's unfortunately standing so much on her feet and a little bit of a heavy girl, maybe. Um, but I would that, that tarsal tunnel syndrome is so uh, so often misdiagnosed as uh, plantar fasciitis. The other thing to remember is you're going to get peripheral nerve uh, sensitization. So you could, you know, patients will swear it's super painful when you touch the bottom of my foot, but remember it's because those, those peripheral nerves have become hypersensitive. Um, so even though the, the compression might be up here, they're going to swear that this is awful. Um, so I think that's a really, really good spot to go for. Um, yeah, he's a great chiropractor, so that, you know, he's already looked at orthotics and biomechanical chain and all that stuff. So you want to try and make sure things are as good as possible. So I won't, I won't talk about that, but I would, uh, yeah, I think in that case, I would go and look at the task tunnel and see, um, see what you can do there. Cool. Rob Sullivan, we haven't got out yet to do any training on the FX because of the, uh, the lockdown. Um, so we're going to do some stuff soon, I think by webinar. So you're going to cover a lot of it then, but just a short one, is, have you got anything to add straight away? Cause I'm sure you've been advising Max as well on this. I, um, I, I spoke to Max recently on this and we added uh, some extra things in. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. The next thing I was going to, to say to Max was a lot of the time when we've got plantar fasciitis, there's always going to be an element of tarsal tunnel involvement. Um, I think the other thing too that we have to consider with plantar fasciitis is a lot of time with this, you're going to have a calcaneal heel spur. And most of these calcaneal heel spurs are asymptomatic. In fact, 99% of the time, they're asymptomatic. But sometimes what can happen with plantar fasciitis, it can actually be a degenerative condition of, of, the, plat of the plantar pronus. And sometimes when that happens, it's more of a repetitive strain uh, type injury type treatment. And sometimes what we have to do is we have to look at more in depth the whole chain that leads to what happens and the reason we get plantar fasciitis is we get a tightening in the gastrocnemius soleus plantaris which basically needs to find length so it finds that length in the plantar fascia so there's your tear but i think we even have to go further up the chain than that we start to have to look at at basically the gracilis what's happening there in terms of rotation of the knee but more so a lot of the time when you have a plantar fascia that doesn't respond there is an involvement of, of the psoas in this. And I think sometimes when you've got an over-tightening of the psoas, it just plays all the way down the body. The body has to find the length. The length that the body will find will always come from the plantar pronus. And I, I think really, um, an in-depth look at her footwear you know does she start off uh, on a monday with a heel this size and then suddenly on a friday decide that, or a saturday decide the heel is going to be this size because then you're getting exacerbation of symptoms because you're actually uh, perpetuating the cycle so it's a case of breaking the cycle uh, other things that have to be looked at around that is is basically do we have bare feet bad idea you know lots of things like that it's something that we will cover when we get to the training, but I would say for now, 
basically go look at things like superficial peroneal nerve, femoral nerve, um, anterior tibial, that kind of thing. Do a little bit of work with them and see if you can just put it to bed. Again, what would I use for that? I'd probably stack the lasers up here and I'd probably use the FX, uh, pretty much putting the central head over the retinaculum, uh, take one head to the medial arch and take the other to basically the, the, the sinus tassi on the opposite side, switch the laser on and then basically go follow your nerve action uh, on an acne protocol just to see exactly where it's coming from, what's happening. That, okay, that's so all. Fine with the okay. you know. Great, thanks Rob. Kirk? Yeah, there's really not too much for me to add there. I just like to also go through and look for any kind of weak muscles as well to, to try to strengthen those up. So I'll go through and do my lower extremity, what, what I call recalibration or upregulation protocol on there, uh, testing them out to see is, is a muscle, are they weak with their foot in you know, a, a flex position, in a, in a extended position, inverted, everted, go up to the calves, quads, hamstrings, so et cetera, looking for these weak muscles and then putting the laser on there for several seconds until I can activate it. So that way she's got support while she's walking. <laughs> a lot of times with these ones too, I'll put them in different phases of gait too and laser them while they're doing different uh, um, gait recalibration things. We don't really have time to go into that uh, today, but that's one other protocol that you know I found to be really helpful with some of these plantar fascia uh, patients. I think too with their size, obviously, and Dr. Silverman can probably go into this more, obviously you gotta look at some nutritional things too with someone who's that large. There's probably a lot of stuff going on with her, you know, inflammation wise, potential hypothyroid going on there as well. And we know if she does have Hashimoto's, which is conservative, at least one in seven, some sources say it's one in two to one in three females, um, they're gonna have slower Healing, they're going to have more inflammation too, so that might need to, need to be addressed as well. Great, Kurt. Um, some of the obviously the chronic plantar fasciitis, but also the uh, the migraine that he mentioned before as well. Uh, real quick, just on the treatment plan stuff, just as a general rule of thumb, with any of the brain based stuff, like when we take on a Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, anything like that, our rule of thumb is we always give our office 12 visits. That's, that's going to be a standard. So with that 12 visits, that gives us that window of opportunity. Uh, Carrie Zhang's right down the road from me here, the podiatrist, that uh, the PI for the plantar fasciitis study. Um, they did six visits, obviously, for the study. Um, that's kind of the bare minimum. As part of that upstream activity, I, I knew Dr. Uh, Sullivan would, would tee this up perfectly because he started to get upstream with the kinetic chain element and things like that. So a couple of things I'll add on from more of the central neurological bias when you start to go upstream. Um, with my FX, with chronic plantar fasciitis, what I'll do is I'll put one head on the nerve root and I'll put the other head down at the, at the heel and just kind of blanket that whole extremity. That's the first half of my treatment. I may throw on something that will down-regulate like TRPV, TRPM, and ASIC receptors like prolotherapies, uh, things like that. But then as I, my second half is one of the big things that, that Dr. S uh, Solvin was bringing up. Um, when we have increased flexor tone, like of the psoas and whatnot, a lot of times that's due to lack of inhibition of ipsilateral pathways coming from the brainstem. Like Dr. Cook can talk more about like the pontine paramedian reticular formation and things like that. So what we call like these, these soft pyramidal signs. And in simple terms, when you, you want to activate the brainstem on that ipsilateral side, so the vagal stimulation on the ipsilateral side actually comes in handy on that because you'll bring that system up. And then going back up into the somatotopic reorganization because ultimately chronic pain becomes an issue of not just the tissue, it starts to change wide dynamic range neurons at the spinal cord level, um, reticular activation at the brainstem, and then parietal reorganization at the central nervous system. So the, the, in the short of it clinically is I'll move my FX up for the second half of the equation to do vagal stem on the ipsilateral side, blanket the parietal integration with my FX, and that will help some of those central neurological mechanisms as well. The next one we should mention, and again, the, the, those that do more functional neurology, is when you're looking at heel strike and gait patterns and whatnot, is that what just have the patient do simple testing like on a Rombergs or better yet, using something like an Airx. Let me grab my Airx balance pad, you know, something like a perturbed surface like that to really expose their center of pressure shifts and whatnot. Because a lot of times what you'll see is maybe they have they're they're leaning back too far on say, let's just say hypothetically that right side. And so what you want to do is neurologically get their center of pressure over off that side more. Well, how we do that is you can take your accelerate and just do your base brain setting we talked about and, and put it right on the mastoid 
of that side of the sway pattern, like say they're falling back and to the right, you laser that mastoid, you'll drive them over to the other side and start to balance out their center of pressure. Now you can use like computerized dynamic posturography and things like that to test for this, but you could just use a $50 AirX pad and typically expose that as well too. So that's just another neurological nugget that might come in play on that case. So. That's brilliant, great advice. Um, he mentioned about troubleshooting with the EVRL. I'm sure I've heard Rob Sullivan and Silverman talking about that before. Um, has anyone got anything to add on that? No? Looks like Sorry, I'm getting I'm getting mixed messages right here. So yeah, no, you, you just um, uh, I think uh, Max has heard from somewhere about tr using the EVRL for troubleshooting. Does, the, does anybody uh, else do, do this? Yeah, I, I think I heard some of the guys already talking about how the red will upregulate, the silver, uh, the the violet will downregulate. You know, <laughs> so you'll expose weak muscles and stuff. The way you know, I'm I'm more of a brain, you know, central guy, as you guys can tell. So, um, what I'll do is like, say I've got cerebellar findings, for example. Say they've got like terminal dysmetria or something like that. What I'll do is to expose that. I'll see is it cerebellar based. I laser the cerebellum and then just retest them, and then it smooths it out. That kind of thing. So we use lasers in a central neurological diagnostic uh, compartment as well as all the peripheral nerve stuff. Okay, thanks for that. It's good to look at that from like different perspectives because we've all sort of seen the muscle test, but what you've just actually discussed, Trevor, I'd never heard that before. So that's that's very good. It's two different ways to actually do it. Yeah. Um, right, guys, at this juncture, uh, that's the end of the, the, the videos. Okay. Uh, I wanted to introduce everybody to, to Sana Homgren. Uh, Sana is, um, has a clinic. It's a couple of hours north of Stockholm. And Sana has been using our lasers for a good few years now. And there was a very interesting case that she treated a couple of years ago. So I'm just going to unmute Sana first, just for her to say hello to everybody before I I play the quick Vimeo. Hey, Simon, I'm going to have to check out. I've got to head into the office. I just wanted to say goodbye to you guys because I got to get in and drive in to get started. So thank you guys for having me on. See you, Dr. Gare. All right. See you hey, guys. Gare. Thank you. No problem. Thanks a lot. I appreciate it. Simon, I'm afraid I'm Thank you, Dr. Gare. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Hi, Sana. How are you? Hi, Simon. I'm fine. I'm very well. Good. I think you, you've you've met the guys. So you've obviously met Trevor, Rob, and Rob. Um, Jake, you haven't yes. met us yet. No. Nice to meet you, Simon. I haven't met Rob, uh, Simon, I'm <laughs> head off as well. I'm afraid I've got to my my time limit, so I'm going to log off. But it's a it's been a real pleasure talking to you guys, and uh, I've learned a lot. So thank you very much. No problem. It, it has gone on longer than we thought. So thanks thanks a lot, Jake. Um, sorry, Sana. We've um, I think we we expected to be at this phase around half an hour or so ago. So thanks very much for coming on. Um, do you okay. want to just, before I put the, the Vimeo on, do you want to just sort of discuss a little bit about uh, about this patient, you know, when it was, um, or, or do you want to wait until after I play it? Uh, I think you actually can play it because uh, I say a lot of stuff uh, in the video, so maybe we can discuss later because it's actually kind of three, four years ago. Uh, but I actually talking about the treatment time and so on. So maybe we can just play the video and we can talk about it after. What sure. do you think? Fantastic. Yep, no problem at all. Yep. I'll put it on now. Thanks, Anna. Perfect. This is Linnea and she's 22. On December 4th, 2016, she was involved in a traffic accident. She had several fractures on her entire left side of the pelvis to the skull.
Simon, can you hear me? Can you hear me, Simon? Hi, sorry, Sana, I was muted out. Yes, I've paused it just in case you want to add something. Yeah. I don't I don't know if it's do you hear the sound? Do you hear the the when I talk about the movie? Because I can't hear the Yes, we can I can, I presume um uh, no, I, 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 don't have, I don't have sound. I, I have no sound. You have no sound. No, that's what I Trevor, thought. Do you have sound? So we can actually we can hear some some of you actually eating or doing the the stuff in the background, but we can't hear the sound on the uh, video. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, I so can I hear at my end. There's obviously some some reason uh, it's not connecting. Um, shall I play it, Sana? Is it possible that you can maybe add some dialogue um, through it if I just play the caption? Uh, I can try. <laughs> I wasn't prepared for it, but I can try. <laughs> it's okay. Just, um, can do it. you know, just if I can play the video and then we can just go through if you can remember anything that you can add. Um, I'm not an IT whiz, so I'm not quite sure why it hasn't actually linked to, um, to the presentation. So sorry about that. Um, but I will play the video just a little bit longer. Um, and then you can maybe add some um, some information at the end, maybe uh, how the patient was actually doing, um, you know, how the patient actually is now compared to how she was back then. Yeah, I try. It's perfect. Yeah, thank you. And she's showing us so, how the result feels in her hand, and this is the result. Yeah, she's just showing how the results feel in her hand. This is the result. Only one yeah. week later, she can well, move it. I can hear the sound. I do a lot of sensory work, skin stim on Linnea, so she can feel which joint she's going to move and what direction and that's very helpful for her so this is actually how we uh, how i work with her as uh, dr trevor um, talked about um, before how we actually work in the stream this is our second okay. session i think this moved us all sana when we first saw this and you know the amazing uh, recovery that this young lady had and you know, yeah. what happened to her at such a young age was just so tragic. And Anea also used her fingers and sign language to communicate. So she couldn't communicate at all. She was actually thinking she was talking to me or her mother, but there was actually just sound uh, through her throat. And she did some sign language and some uh, writing on her. In our fourth session, we actually could hear her say, Need to go to the bathroom. This is time working with the brainstem of the cranial nerves and everything, uh, like the my neurology stuff. And she could actually, after four times, say uh, that she wanted to go to the bathroom on her phone. And her mother was so surprised. She was actually starting to cry. About how she can talk and pronounce the words. Here she Still brings a tear to my eye now, actually, watching it. She's so happy. She then tells me her name and explained to me that she has two surnames. This is the first time we speak to each other and don't need the assistance or the mother. So this is our six times that we were actually so saying her social security number just six weeks after the first session 
Here you can see her first experience of the low level laser therapy and what she felt. This is her third session. Amazing. Yes. Just the changes over this short period of time, it's, it's, it's miraculous. Yes, it actually is. Um, so this is the first time she actually got the laser and how she feels everything just loose and, and, and the tightness and the, the spasm she has on her left side actually releases uh, and she never felt it before after the accident. Fantastic, brilliant. Feeling. So now she's talking to her mother with uh, just the fingers on her knees. And she wants and more. Her, and she says, I want to have more laser. <laughs> <laughs> It becomes so relaxed. Of the you can just see the change in expression in her face. Just, yes. it's, it's yes. elation. So we did actually start, we actually start with a lot of um, work with her eyes and because of the midbrain, mesencephalon, is actually responsible for the skeletal, uh, the muscle skeleton, um, and she actually needed to increase the, the midbrain, the mesencephalon. So we started actually with the eyes to change that. And then we actually can do with the lasers on the midbrain and the brainstem and actually work with the um, frontal lobe and cerebellar activity on the left side. Brilliant. Seven weeks after the first session, she stopped walking several times a week. We have worked a lot with sensory input so she can have more natural movement and of course low level laser therapy. But we have also done percussive treatments for releasing of the fascia. Yeah. So uh, just a couple of weeks before those sessions, uh, her mother uh, phoned me uh, called me and asked if i can do something for her because the doctor couldn't do anything more for her and i said okay i don't know actually but i can try and i'm really interesting to help her uh, and the goal for linnea was to be able to walk again and to talk again and now when i met her the first time as you saw and um, she couldn't walk or she couldn't talk so i really felt i don't know if i can help her but i I do what I can do uh, with the, the applied neurology stuff and the laser. And this is actually six weeks later. So I was really surprised myself that the laser and the applied neurology actually could do so so much for her on such a, such a so, uh, short time. Did you, uh, obviously, Sana, you have seen a lot of, um, you know, other patients. Do you, do you see many with similar problems that you've used your experiences here uh, to the benefit of them as well? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. I have a lot of um, um, clients that had uh, has um, uh, paralyzed in in some part of the bodies or in the face, for example. And I actually have a, um, a woman that she she is uh, 26 years old, and she'd actually woke up one day totally paralyzed on her right side and the face was just like hanging on the right side and the eye wasn't working at all and she couldn't walk and so they thought she has a stroke or parkinson's so she actually took three years before the doctors find out they didn't find anything on her they didn't know what uh, uh, what had caused this um, uh, paralysis in her body so she actually heard um, a presentation from me and, and she said i need to see you so uh, i started to actually work with her and find out that actually was some uh, cranial nerve uh, three that was actually changed her whole right side on her uh, right brainstem so when we started to work with the cranial nerve three and the laser on the brainstem, the it's totally changed everything. So sometimes I actually could just paralyze her right side, and just a second later I can actually 
uh, put it on again so it actually everything works it again so i can i always work with the laser and applied neurology at the same time with really amazing results and just cases like this even if yeah, it's uh, um, injury, um, uh, injuries or it's actually, they don't know what it is that's actually caused the symptoms. Yeah, I mean, th this was a learning curve for you at the time. Uh, you yeah, were one of uh, our first clinics in, uh, in Europe to actually have the laser, if not the yeah. first um, clinic, especially in applied neurology. Um, yeah. You know, and, and I hope to have you back on in, in a, in a few weeks time to go a little bit more in depth in your experiences because th this sort of thing uh, is fantastic. Yeah, thanks. I'll play, I'll just move forward a little bit on yeah, this one, long video. Mm -hmm. And she can move her wrist. Wow. Wow, vilken skillnad, Linnea. Gör du ont när du gör det? Mm. Nej. Fingrarna. And she can move her fingers. Titta. Kolla, Linnea. Vad duktig du är. Det är ju jättebra. Det är ju jättebra. Gör du... Gör det ont i dem? Fantastiskt! She couldn't right. move her fingers or hand or arm at all um, or her, her foot on the left side. So this is actually a huge change in her movement pattern. Yeah, it is. Well, can I just ask, Sana, when, when was the last time you, and this is three, four years ago, but when was the last time you saw the patient and, and how was she getting on? It's actually a well, um, uh, year ago now, uh, and she's <laughs> it's amazing actually because she don't use her wheelchair. Uh, she's out walking. Yes, yes. She, of course, she has a stick, uh, but she's um, such a huge change in her mobility because she actually can be out walking. She can do her dishes and laundry by herself. Uh, of course, she has an, still an assistant, but um, she can do so much more on her own. But when she's when you are 23 years old uh, for now, um, of course, you want to be living as a 24 years old girl. Uh, so she's actually kind of disappointed that she has actually couldn't come further but uh, I want to go further I want to still work with her but she want to take a break so that's why we didn't have seen her for a, a year now All right okay no I mean you know yeah. just just I suppose you know the, the the changes that were made in her I suppose in her own self she probably thought that would just continue continue and you know, we all have sometimes this yeah. blind faith where we feel we're going to be back to how we were before. But when you sit back and you look at the progress that she actually made, it's, it was magnificent over that period of time. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And comparing to what the doctors has told her before I met her, that they couldn't do anything further for her or more for her. So this is a completely change for her that she actually could come this far. So that's yeah. so positive, uh, but as you said, she maybe needed one some more of it. Uh, but uh, I haven't given up on her, so <laughs> I'm gonna keep on working with her. Well, I've known you long enough to know that you will carry on persevering. Um, I think Trevor, <laughs> you've probably seen this before. Rob Silverman, have you seen it? Has it seen what, Simon? Sorry, could you clarify the question? Yeah, just uh, the, the video that. Um, that I've been playing that uh, that Sana did for us a few years ago. Uh, have you actually seen this one before? I've not seen the video, but these types of cases are quite common, and it, Sana did a great job. Obviously, she's really nailed the you know all the, all of her neurological applications with the laser, and yeah, it's kind of the, I hate to say it, it's you know when you work in this area, it's so underserved and. And you open up so many doors, but we kind of take it for granted. We see these kind of miracles, you know, every day at our office. And I've kind of become numb to what people are calling miracle type results. But when you're using lasers, it really helps facilitate a lot of those miracle quote unquote cases. And so, uh, 
you know, I should probably be a little more excited than I get when I, you know, get somebody walking again or get somebody moving a limb again that was told that they're they're never going to be able to do that. So I, I hate to say it, but we kind of almost take it for granted with this cool technology. Yeah, no, I agree. It's not the first time I've heard that as well. But you know, like a lot in 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 um, Europe and the Middle East, you know, it's a, it's a learning curve, and we're very lucky to have um, the likes of yourselves and Sana um, to try to help uh, the European and Middle Eastern market. Because you know you guys had to start from scratch and you learnt, and the experience and the knowledge that you've got now has made you what you are. And we hope that you know others can join us and uh, and and get the same level of knowledge and education. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll keep doing that. We'll keep getting. I I look forward to getting back over to the other side of the pond when the when the flights open up and whatnot. I uh, definitely welcome the opportunity. And I know Dr. Silverman loves being over there as well too. So. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. We um, we're still hoping to to do a uh, a seminar in Dubai at the start of um, of September. But the most important part, the flights will be back on. The most important part is that the hotels or wherever we hold it at can keep everybody safe and healthy. So um, yeah, I think 2021 we will uh, look forward to getting out and seeing everybody a lot more. And I'm sure both of you and and Sana would agree with that. Yeah, absolutely. Indeed. Sana, I, I need to apologize. I put you on the spot today, but as normal, you always <laughs> deliver. Um, I think the, the, the meeting at the start might have been, for some reason, when I muted my voice, it muted yours for everybody else as well. So apologies for that. That's a learning <laughs> curve for me. Um, but we've already gone two and a half hours now, and, and I think we could probably go another two and a half hours uh, if we wanted to. And, and you know, this will be the beauty of when we hold the seminars and we want to to always look at things from different perspectives. We've got lucky to have Dr. Berry, Dr. Silverman, Sana, Dr. Gare. And, you know, my father always taught me when I was younger, listen to all the experts, and then just pick little bits of information from each of them and then develop your own technique. So um, that's, I'm sure everybody agrees, is, is great advice. Um, and we look forward to, uh, to welcoming you all on board. Um, and yeah, thanks guys. Appreciate everybody's time. We're going to close it now because otherwise we'll upset Mr. Stephen Shanks from Aconia, who's the president, and he's doing a presentation in around 30 minutes. So uh, thank you very much for your time. Sana, thanks so much for coming on. Thank you for having me, Simon. I really enjoyed and, uh, it. Yeah, we'll, we'll get something else out soon that we can involve Sana in. And I know Dr. Silverman earlier on had a, an idea of where we could go with the next roundtable event. And um, yeah, if, if yeah. we can beat that eight hour time scale with you, Trevor. Hopefully, we'd be able to get you back on and definitely arrange some seminars next year. I'd have to be happy to yeah. join you guys. It was, it was an honor and a privilege. Thanks for having me. And thanks to the other docs out there. You guys are doing a great job. Simon, I love what you said. You know, we give ideas, but the field of neurology is so diverse. And just use whatever your, your techniques and your what you're comfortable with. Start to implement this stuff. Look at pre and post outcomes in your practice. You'll be amazed. Always get to the brain. The laser is a perfect modality to safely use on the brain and use some basic protocols like we talked about today. Uh, you know, I love that one, 10, 40, 60. You're not going to go wrong with that. Um, it, for a neuroprotective thing, protecting against Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, stroke, traumatic brain injury outcomes, things like that. Anytime you get laser on the tissue, you're going to have much better outcomes. And I just want to thank everyone. It's been an honor to be here. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. And one final thing, Dr. Rob you, Sullivan John. is responsible for our training program in Europe. And uh, he is, as always, likes to be educated. He's been across to Dr. Berry's clinic in Arizona. He wants to go to Dr. Silverman's clinic in New York. And, and, and Rob Sullivan's, you know, always wanting to learn new things. And we're lucky to have him as well. Thank you, Simon. I thought you were speechless for a second there. That's not normal. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I, I'm just giving my chin a rest for a little while. Right. Again, thank you very much, everybody, and, and have a lovely afternoon or evening, depending on where you are. And uh, we look forward to speaking to you again soon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.